Okay, we're going to call the B BZA meeting to order. Um, beyond circumstances, beyond anything that we could control, any circumstances we can control, this is why we're at this building. Uh, 004, the Reagan room was available at our last hearing, and then suddenly it wasn't available. So that's the reason we're here. Um, pure and simple. That's, there's, there's no other reason. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and call the hearing to order. And Mr. Dixon, um, would you, there's two new pieces of correspondence that have been submitted since our last hearing. And would you go ahead and read those so that we can, we can uh, um, put those in the file? Okay, this is a continued hearing from August. Um, one is a letter from a Mark Depo. He is a director, Department of Community Planning and Development. Uh, it's dated July 18th, 2022, but the Office of Administrative Hearings did not get it until uh, the last few days. So this is the response from the City of Westminster. City of Westminster did not approve water or sewer for the existing group home at 829 Franklin Avenue. The property owner must submit a City of Westminster water and sewer allocation application to determine the amount of water needed for the group home use and obtain approval of such application by the city. As for the proposed ex uh, assisted living facility, the property owner must Submit a City of Westminster water and sewer allocation application to determine the amount of the water needed for the proposed assisted living facility use and obtain approval of such application by the city. Please be advised, depending on the proposed use, water and sewer may not be available at this time. Any approval for a use or, com or, or commencement of a use that has not obtained an approved City of Westminster water and sewer allocation application is in violation of the City of Westminster water and sewer allocation policy. <clears throat> and then there is a October 4th uh, email from Carl and Lou Blessing. They attach a statement. Uh, a lot of it is uh, cumulative based on uh, other statements that have been made uh, at the last hearing, but I'll just go over a few. They were not made aware of the halfway house for women across the street when they bought the house. They stopped sitting on the front porch due to loud, vulgar language being used by individuals sitting on a front porch of the house at 8.03. One uh, granddaughter who has a front bedroom often complained about the women and how loud they were even late at night as she could hear them with her window closed. There have been multiple incidences where police and ambulances have been at the house for various reasons. We have, seen, we have seen individuals removed from the house on stretchers as recent as July of this year. They, written, they have witnessed arguments and screaming matches in the front yard. People appeared uh, uh, at the house to be high and they were stumbling and falling around in the front yard. So those two, two things are additional uh, pieces of uh, will be added to the record. <clears throat> and we'll accept those into evidence. Okay, with that, my recollection is that there, the applicant has at this point called three witnesses. I'm assuming there are more, Mr. Bumgardner? That's correct, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so that's where we'll, that's where we'll take up. But before we take up, there's a couple of things. Make sure that your electronic devices are uh, put on silence or vibrate. Um, and I'm going to remind everybody it's a get-go here today. Uh, when people are testifying, 
please give them the respect that they deserve when they're testifying. Uh, I don't have a gavel, but if I stand up, it's going to get ugly. Um, so I just want to just tell you that. So make sure that when there's testimony, um, whether you agree or disagree with it, please give the people respect that are giving a testimony. There's microphones on the side for, for everyone in the audience. Uh, the, the, the attorneys, I'm assuming, will call their witnesses to the front table here. Um, with that, I don't know if anyone was here before, but the process is the applicant, uh, Mr. Bumgardner is representing them. Uh, he will call witnesses after each witness uh, gives their testimony. You will have the opportunity in the audience to ask questions of their testimony. And then I'm assuming Mr. Lazuriaga will have witnesses. Uh, he'll, he'll go after Mr. Bumgardner. Uh, you, anyone in the audience can ask questions of his witnesses' testimony. At that point, you can give your own testimony. So again, witnesses, witnesses, you can only ask questions of their testimony at this point. Um, is that not on the side? Do we have a sign-in sheet? So we do have a sign-in. If you haven't signed in on the sign-in sheet, uh, there's one down here in the front row. So with that, because this is a different hearing, if you plan on testifying here today, or if you're questioning any of the witnesses, could you please stand and raise your right hand and take the oath? Do you swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Very good. You can be seated. Mr. Baumgartner. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Derek Baumgartner from the law firm of Whiteford, Taylor, and Preston on behalf of the applicant Mulligan Recovery Centers. Uh, a point of clarification um, real quick um, for Mr. Dixon. The email from the community member, there was an address that was read with that email. Um, I believe that was 803 yes, Franklin Avenue. Um, and this property is 829 Franklin Avenue. I just wanted to clarify that for the record. Um, there was information in that email with regard to folks sitting on a porch, disturbances, but that was not the property that we're here for today, I don't believe. Um, the address was 803. I just read the letter. Yep. Understood. Understood. Uh, I believe um, Mr. Mr. Elizariaga has a point of order, uh, and we're happy to. Thank you. Uh, good morning, board members. Matthew Lazuriaga, that's L-U-Z-U-R-I-A-G-A. -A. Uh, I do represent uh, three individuals who are seated here with me. Um, the only thing I wanted to bring to the board's attention is uh, Mr. Mark Depot from the City of Westminster is here. Uh, he is not here at my request. He's not under my subpoena. Um, however, uh, I spoke with him briefly yesterday. He informed me that he wanted to make sure that his July correspondence made it into the record, but he also does not intend to stay here and make sure that the city's interests are represented all day. I think he wanted to come, make sure that the letter came in. He may have a few comments, and if there were any questions from the board or the community, I think he's prepared to answer those, but if I'm not mistaken, he has other things to do with the rest of his day, so I don't know if the board wants to take that out of turn or not. If, if that's agreeable to you, Mr. Baumgartner? That's fine, sir. Okay, so you can go ahead and, I, he's not technically your witness, but. He's not, no, no. Okay. Well, it, I can ask you, is there anything more you want to add? It appears there is. <clears throat> when you go to the microphone, sir, I'll state your name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. and sewer system of the of Westminster. The applicant has submitted the water and sewer allocation application 2256 um, on July 25th, 2022 for the assisted living facility. However, just at this time, we do not have any water available for 2022 for 
uh, residential development in the county that are, again, on water and sewer in the city. And let, let me ask, I have no idea about your policies, so I'm a little intrigued, a little puzzled. So if, for example, a family of four moves into a house, uh, they sell their house, and a family of six moves in, do they need to make application to you? Or is this because it went from a residential use to an assisted living faci facility? If it maintains a single family detached use, uh, they would not have to come back before us. So if it's existing, it has a water envelope, it's anticipated you're using, in this case for single family detached, 235 gallons per day. Um, we look at any change in use and again, the group home and assisted living facility, we would, the application allows us to make that determination. Does it maintain the same uh, allocation? Does it maintain the same function as a single family detached? Uh, if it does, if that's determined, then it's a wash. There is no water necessary. The application's approved. If they do need additional water, um, one, it has to be available, and two, they would have to go through a good cause waiver through the Mayor and Common Council to allocate that water to them. So, uh, so, so, so let me just clarify. This is based on the use of the property, not water usage. So if, say, for example, a family that was very water, uh, they, they conserved their water, they were very frugal about it, and another family moved in and they used twice as much water. This isn't based on water, this isn't based on the water meters, this is based on the use of the property. Absolutely. Um, okay. So every use. I just use, want to get that perfectly clear. So office is an example. We use a multiplier for square footage. Same with um, warehouse. Same with the residential. Residential is fairly easy. It's 235, per, uh, 235 gallons per day for a single family detached. Um, assisted living facility, we would look at beds. How many beds are there available or something to that effect. And that would be a multiplier that would tell us how much water needs to be allocated to the property. There's always that option or the ability that they don't use that allocation or extend or go beyond that. But the concept is over time and as you look at the entire system, it balances out and it averages out. And this is all working through MDE. It's their multipliers that we use um, to determine that we have available water. Right now we have about 18,000 gallons of water left in the city um, for any development throughout the city and the county. So it's very important that we monitor that water usage. Okay, and another question, the timeline, because did I hear someone say that the, the applicant in the BZA case today made application to the city in July? In July, 20, July 25th, 2022, yes. So what's the timeline on your determination? Uh, we, we have a 45 day uh, review period for that. Um, but at the end of the day, if the determination was they need additional water and we do not have water available for them. So that water allocation application cannot be approved. Tentative allocation can't be given until that water is available or they go through the proper process to obtain that water. The problem here is that the good cause waiver cannot, you cannot go through that process because there's no water to give them to allocate to them because there are categories of, there's a certain category for every type of development, commercial, industrial, inside, outside city, residential, inside, out the, inside and outside the city. And each one of those categories has an allocation associated with it that, that's taken as new development occurs. In this case, there is no water available in the residential category for outside the city. So we can't, we, they, we cannot approve that application at this time until that water is available. Is, that <clears throat> is the allocation that has been applied for, is that for the existing eight beds or is that for assuming expansion to 10 beds? It's for the, the what's before you today, the assisted, facility, assisted living facility. And I, I believe you indicated it's not, there's no allocation available in 2022. Recognizing you don't have a crystal ball, do you have any prediction on when it might be available? All water in the residential allocation for outside the city has been allocated in some fashion up until 2024. Uh, until we get a new water source or new water source comes along, 
We're trying to work with MDE to get additional water through a well. We have a wastewater, a pure water program. So until we get that new water source and we reallocate and redistribute that in some manner, um, it's, I cannot tell you when and if it would be available. It could be six months, it could be three, four years. Thank you. An another question. They're presently operating with eight beds. It, do they have water allocation for that? They do not. We, we did not receive a water and sewer allocation application for the group home. Board members, any other questions of Mr. Depos? Okay, well, I know I did it a little bit backwards from what we normally do, but does anyone in the audience have any questions of, of, of his testimony? No, no, you have to go to the microphone and identify yourself, sir. Yes, sir. And questions of his testimony. You'll be able to give your testimony Correct. later. Okay. Name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. James Billingsley, Jr., B-I-L-L-I-N-G-S-L-E-A, insurance and real estate broker, and my address is 329 Denton Drive, Westminster, Maryland. Okay. My, my question was the same as yours, but I just touched base on it. You know, this has happened very quickly, these neighborhoods getting group homes, whatever you want to call <clears> them, <throat> in there. And I don't know that anybody knew there was a check that they had to apply for the uh, good or for water resources. So, you know, you answered the question, what does that mean when somebody puts in a usage in a property and doesn't get the approval? Is it something that can be stopped based on not just the extra beds, but apparently there was no approval for any water resources in group homes. And I'm just wondering whether that would be something that would give a cease and desist or something like that. Mr. Depot, can you respond to that? And if you can't, simply can. state that. I'll, and, again, I'll, and, and, and this isn't uncommon. We're running through this throughout a lot of uses in the county and in the city because we are limited uh, to how much water we have available in these categories. So it's not uncommon that people wait and until that water becomes available. But um, it would be in violation of the policy and it would be a municipal infraction, I believe, for water usage that was not otherwise allocated. Um, so again, we're, it's complaint driven. We would not know that obviously, um, unless there was some unusual spike in the water billing, um, that we would notice that there's maybe some concern as to water usage for that property. But again, this is not uncommon that development happens in the county prior to water and sewer allocation being uh, granted through the city. Unfortunately. So to Mr. Billingsley's comment, at what point does a new owner of a property in the environs that's served by sewer and water know that they need to make application for uh, water allocation? I can't speak to the county process. I, I, if they if a building permit gets submitted. No, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking count in the county, but served by Westminster City sewer and water, which is what we're dealing with today. There's two possibilities when a building permit submitted. If it's on city water system, the building permit is forwarded to the city for our review and approval. At that point, we would look at that building permit to determine whether we believe a water and sewer allocation is necessary. So the building permit technically would not be issued until the city signs off on its portion of that building permit. Or if an individual is coming in for a new water meter or a new water um, 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 account. If somebody buys that property and they come in for a new account, we're gonna look at what the, what the new account is for and ask that question. Is it maintaining single family? Is it not? Or if somebody's asking for a water meter, obviously that's a clear giveaway that um, there should have been some review by the city of Westminster. Okay, so it's been testified to in our previous hearing, well, our, our hearing that was that, that's being continued today, that they went through the permits office in order to get the additional beds in that facility. 
So why wasn't it caught by the county at that point? I, why, why wasn't the city notified when the permits were pulled to do the improvements inside the structure? I, I cannot speak to that. We did not receive a permit. We, did, we were notified about the application for a special exception. Um, that's when we became aware of the, of the assisted living facility and then we contacted the applicant that there was a water and sewer allocation necessary, which then they did submit that application. Um, I'm, I can't speak to why we did not receive the building permit. Because you, you said that... We should receive the building permit. Okay. Yes, it's but not... in this case, it did not happen like that. Yes. Go ahead. Mr. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So I'm trying to discern, not necessarily process, but how, do, how is the situation deconflicted? Because based on what I'm understanding is by state law, these folks are allowed to have this facility in this neighborhood, okay? That, so that is a permitted use, whatever the case may be. Does the city subordinate to the state in that the state says this is an allowable use within this residential neighborhood? Um, so do you conform and subordinate to that or is there a conflict in that? I'm not, the city's not subject to the use, whether it's a group home, an assisted living facility, or a single family detached, or state law in this case, when it comes to a county development. The only thing we're looking at is water availability. Do, do, they ha do we have the water available for them to function? Do they have the available um, services necessary for them to function? Uh, so that's all we're looking at. We look at the use, we determine water allocation, and if we have water available. If we don't, we can't get that water. So that, that use is not operating, you know, meeting its water sewer demands or requirements. And I, I understand what you're saying. Um, you know, I understand the, the four corners in which you're speaking. The flip side of the equation is that, and these are my words, in the eyes of the state and allowing this use within residential, within the zoning laws, allowing this within the four corners of the residential use, would the argument be made that this really isn't a change in use because it's an accepted use within the residential zoning? And that's all part of the water and sewer allocation process. Again, if, it, if you're looking at an assisted living facility and if they have to go through a special exception, I think that demonstrates it's not the same use. It's not a single family detached use. Otherwise, they would not need a special exception. Um, and we look at the use assisted living facility. That's what it's termed. That's what it's, we're being told it is, not a single family detached and assisted living facility. So that's what we would work on with MDE to determine water availability. Again, they can, they can make that argument. We do work with people throughout this process. And we don't want to give water away we don't have. We want to make sure we're giving away the right amount of water so other people, so it's available for other people. So we do spend a lot of time and work closely with applicants to try to get that actual amount of water for usage. But I, I'd equate it to this. If it's a vacant piece of property and they wanted to build a single family house and they didn't have water, they could not build a single family house and therefore you could not have the, the and I'm, residential. And again, I'm just trying to get yeah. clarity. So, but essentially if someone has a home that four people are living in and those folks move out and someone that has 10 kids, a family of 10 moves into a home, there's not a need to do a request for a reallocation of water, is that correct? That's correct, there's no change of use occurring in this case. We're being told it's a change of use occurring. Understood. Okay, board, yeah, but wait, board members, <coughs> any other questions? Good. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Eckerd. So in the instance of the water allocations, if I'm understanding this correctly, this is similar to the adequate facilities requirements within the county? It's, it's, similar, to, it's, it's, it's similar to an adequate public facility requirement. Um, again, it's, but it, it is and it isn't. You need to have water and sewer. You need that service. In this case, it's do we have the available water for them? Um, so it's... It's similar, but not the same. It's not an ordinance. It's not, um, it, it's, it's a little bit different. 
I jumped out of order a little bit as far as the questioning of, of Mr. Depot. Um, Mr. Bumgardner, Mr. Lazuriaga, do you have questions of his testimony? That's how we should have started out. But I, I don't, I, thank I, you. I jumped in. I'm, I, I circumvented my, our own policy. No problem. Mr. I Bumgardner, do. any questions of Mr. Depot's? None at this time. Okay. <clears throat> and, but he's not going to be available. Sounds like he wants to get back to. <laughs> he, he wants to the escape this. He wants to escape <laughs> this venue. As fun as this is. But. Um, so. That's fine. Thank you. You good? And we're, we're good. Okay. Very good. Make sure you identify yourself and re remember questions of Mr. Depot's um, uh, testimony. My name is Rebecca Kepner, K E P N E R. I live at 824 William Avenue. I'm a contract administrator. have the necessary um, things that they need to attend to the activities of daily living of the people who are living in the assisted living. Is that what that means? I, I can't answer that question. Okay. Again, the, the water is still flowing to the building. Um, it's, there's nothing on the water supply going into the building that limits 235 gallons a day. It, it's anticipated that single family house, you're gonna have 280 one day, 100 the next day, 300 one day, 250 another. It's just, it, it's not an absolute. So water's not, not going to the facility. The issue would be um, with this use occurring, they're then, alloc they're then using through MDE standards and what we've accepted water that was not otherwise allocated that is not available at this time for them. So oh, again, they'd be in violation of the policy. It doesn't. Uh, we don't, we're not in the, we don't, we don't come out and shut people down. Our goal is to comply and bring people into compliance so we work with the applicant. And in this case, it really is that waiting for that availability of water. And we are working to get more um, in the city up to 1.5 million more through the water reuse and pure water system. So um, once we get that additional water source, we would look at all these applications like this one that we have waiting. We have several applications that are sitting there waiting that we cannot approve because we don't have water for them that we would then try to um, ensure that these applications get water. Okay. Um, again, the city's not opposed to the use. It's simply water. It's is there water available for this use? And at this time, there is not. My follow-up question is if there's, if there's increased use by one property owner, be it in assisted living or single family use, does that negative effect negatively affect the rest of the community and their ability to access water? No, it does not. Again, okay. it's the water system is still flowing through the community. It's, it will be this property, this property only. Each property has its own shutoff, each property has its own meter. Um, so there's other ways we can deal with just this property versus the community as a whole. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Go to the microphone, sir, and state your name, address, and occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Jake Townsley, T-O-W-N-S-L-E-Y, 736 David Avenue. I'm two doors down from one of the existing facilities. I came to his office in February to apply for an application for sewage and was denied. And uh, I would also like to state that I've worked for the county and retired after 33 years of service here. Um, lived at 736 David Avenue for 47 years. And uh, so I, I guess I'm reinforcing what he is stating. However, I wouldn't water use of his uh, but, but, but Mr. Townsley, what is your question? Remember, that's, that's actual okay. testimony. So what is your question of Mr. Depot? Why, why was I denied for the sewage, that's all. And I guess it's, he's going to go back to statement that uh, they're not offering any permits outside the county or in, for the county. Uh, was I? I can, don't know. Can, can, I don't can know you speak to that, Mr. Depot? Yeah, that's, yeah. 
Why was I denied? That's all I'm asking. So, does it go back? Again, it's availability. Um, I don't think we've denied any application since I've been in the city. We just they're just they're just not moving forward. So we have a, we have multiple applications sitting there until availability is until availability is there. Um, so once again, once we get that availability and sewer availability, um, we would reevaluate all these applications. I can't speak specifically to this one. You also have to be in the water and sewer service area. If you're outside those areas, we cannot serve you. Uh, we're, not, we're not allowed to. You have to extend that sewer, water and sewer service area. The other element is, too, you have to have water and sewer available uh, close to you. Otherwise, you have to extend the water and sewer to your property, and a lot of times that is difficult. Um, so I can't speak specifically about this one, but there could be several factors outside of just the water and sewer allocation policy and allocating of water. Go, go to a microphone, please. And I'll state your name, address, and occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Yeah, Rick Dorsey, D-O-R-S-E-Y, real estate. Um, in, in response to um, Mark here, Mr. Depot's testimony today, I was just curious, when the water becomes available, does the city of Westminster, I want to say, first allocate resources within the city limits before they would go outside to the county as we're in the county? Um, and I, I personally have sewer and water on my street, and Mr. Townsley lives only three doors up from me. Um, so th that's, that's my question. Does the city take precedence? And those applications that are in the city, would they take precedence over homes that are outside the city limits and in the county but are being serviced by the city's utility? Thank you. No. Uh, there, there's no it's all in the allocation process. We, once we have the amount of water available, if we get a new water source and 100,000 gallons become available per day, through a new water source. We would look at that redistribution of the master table and determine where water should be available. And again, as I stated, any applications we have in-house, staff would be arguing those should be first and foremost. We should be looking at allocating water to those applications that have been waiting. Um, anybody in the water and sewer system in the, on the city system is served today. Uh, it's, I'm not sure what the question was, but um, the goal is we, this gets a little bit beyond what we're talking today, we have a mass, maximum expansion limit around the city. There's the idea is everybody on water and sewer that someday should be within the city. That's the concept. If somebody wants more water in the, in the city or in the county, um, if they're adjacent to the city, they're required to annex into the city. So then they become part of the city. If they're outside that annexation potential, they go through a good cause waiver and they sign an agreement that at such time they can annex, they will annex in the city. The goal is that the city meets those maximum expansion limits. So it's the benefit is coming to the city, absolutely. Um, but that is the goal. You, these properties are in the maximum expansion limit. The goal is they will someday be part of the city. Okay, any other questions of Mr. Depot? Yes, sir. Remember, questions of his testimony, and please state your name, address, and occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Steve Kennedy, 822 Fairfield, and I'm a school teacher. Um, is it fair to assume that there are businesses and organizations that are playing by the rules and waiting until they get um, the waiver or to the water allocation? I don't like the term plain by the rules. Ultimately, there was a water and sewer allocation application submitted for this property. We have multiple water and sewer allocation applications for properties both in the city and the county that we cannot, we don't have water available that are sitting there and waiting. Um, so uh, they can't move forward. We can't sign off on that building permit. They can't, they can't expand their business or bring a new business in until that allocation is approved and the building permit is otherwise approved. So again, they are, they've submitted an application just as anybody else wanting additional water. 
And just to follow up, have they submitted three applications for the three properties? I can't speak to that. I'm not sure. I'm only here for this application and this address. Thank you. Any other questions on Mr. Depot's testimony? Very good. Mr. Depot, you are free to leave the building and thank you for thank the you. education on the sewer and water <laughs> master plan for Westminster City. There's so much more too, so <laughs> thanks. Thank you for the disruption. I mean, <laughs> going, going out of order. Mr. Baumgartner, thank let, you, let's, let's continue and uh, you can go ahead and call another witness at this point if you would like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The applicant will call Rachel Marcus. Ms. Marcus, could you please um, give the board your full name and your professional address, please? Hi, good morning. My name is Rachel Marcus. Um, I have a private practice. Um, we operate out of 1100 Business Parkway South, Westminster 21157. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And who was your employer? So I have, um, currently I work for a company called Recovery 180 and I also have, um, I own a group practice. So it's called um, RL Counseling Group. And Ms. Marcus, do you possess any licenses or certifications in your field? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, um, trained in psychotherapy, um, and I've been practicing since 2012. And if you can just uh, provide the board a very brief overview of your education, um, years, institutions, sure. et cetera. Um, so I graduated from Franklin High School. Um, I then went to College Park, University of Maryland from 2000 to 2004. Um, and then I went and got a master's degree in social work from University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, graduated there in 2012. And Ms. Marcus, what is your involvement with Mulligan Recovery Centers? So I, um, being a professional in the community, I myself am also in long-term recovery from substance abuse. Um, I have 14 years clean and sober. so. I became involved in the recovery community personally and as well as professionally. I worked at um, Carroll County Youth Service Bureau and then a few other substance abuse treatment centers. And over the years, um, Mulligan Treatment Center has been part of our uh, resources um, in terms of the community. It's a referral source for my private practice, also uh, several other um, substance abuse treatment centers that I have worked for. We would refer clients back and forth to Mulligan. Um, for substance abuse treatment. Um, so hopefully that answered everything. It does, thank you. Uh, in your experience thus far, how has Mulligan been um, as, a, um, as either a referral source or um, working, with, uh, re working with residents at Mulligan? So there's two parts to this. I think my, my experience referring clients to Mulligan through the treatment centers that I've worked at has been extremely positive. They have a really well-run admissions department and clients feel really connected just, just by getting on the phone with their admissions people. Um, they really wanna get to know the clients before they admit them. It's not something where they just take anyone. They're really pretty, um, you know, they use discretion in who they're admitting to their program because I've, from what I've gathered, it's, it's really important to them to have a community that is healthy and positive and have people that really, clients that really want to be successful and aren't just looking for you know, a place to live. Um, so that's been really positive. And then I myself have worked with clients who are in Mulligan and I'll do the mental health side of the um, treatment and the clients are really happy. Like they're really part of a community. They're part of a, um, a program that really feels like they are cared about and valued and um, you know, they meet their requirements, and, and really what I've heard about Mulligan most is that they're, um, they hold the clients accountable. It isn't just a place where they can kind of get away with lots of stuff. It has a reputation of being pretty structured and pretty uh, well-run, and um, 
and clients don't just get to kind of goof off and do whatever they want. They really do have to adhere to the, the rules and the, the policies of the program. So that's my experience from, from working with their clients directly. Do you plan on continuing to counsel clients and residents at 829 Franklin Avenue? I do, yes. Can you very briefly describe for the board members, um, strike that, um, you were here on the August 31st date, correct? Yes. And you heard the testimony from Helen and Brian McCall? Yes. And you heard the testimony from Frank Beck? Yes. Uh, there was testimony during day one of, of, of this hearing regarding a level 3.1 treatment. Yes. Uh, can you provide, uh, again, a very brief overview or summary of what level 3.1 treatment um, is all about? Um, so level 3.1 is in my experience, a step-down program. So it's clients that have completed some sort of inpatient, longer-term treatment so that their mental health or substance abuse issues are at least stable enough to be back in the community. Um, so the idea of a 3.1 is to give clients an opportunity to have a little bit more time while they're still living in a structured program, while they're still receiving clinical services, but they don't need this 24-7, you know, in one building, can't leave kind of set up. They're, they're more... Um, given a little bit more freedom, and it's, it's sort of a, a gateway to getting back to independent living, having their own place, you know, really living on their own again. So it's, it's a bit of a bridge, is my perspective. Thank you very much. From your experience thus far with Mulligan, um, and your understanding from being uh, in the hearing on, on um, August 31st, um, is your understanding that this application is to increase services from eight residents to 10 residents, is that correct? Yes. In your professional opinion, will that slight increase from eight residents to 10 residents uh, offer more opportunity for folks in the community to receive service at this residential treatment center? Yes. Uh, lastly, are, um, Ms. Marcus, are you aware of any other level 3.1 treatment centers in the greater Carroll County area at this time? And if I, you're not, that's fine. I am aware of um, definitely one, I, I think two, um, but there, there's, to my knowledge, no more than that. Is there a need for more 3.1 services in the greater Carroll County area? So I fully believe there is. I, having worked at inpatient substance abuse, there's a, there's a real difficulty in finding aftercare programs that are available for clients mm -hmm. to, to kind of have that experience of still having structured living, but also, you know, having a bit more freedom <coughs> so that they can get used to living back in the world. And, you know, either beds are full or the programs just don't exist. Um, so yes, I, I think it's much needed. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have for Ms. Marcus at this time. Okay, does anyone in the audience have any questions of Ms. Marcus's? I do. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Matt, I, you, I wore my camouflage suit today, totally I understand. totally thrown me off, man. <laughs> okay, Mr. Lazariaga. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Marcus, good morning. Good morning. Um, congratulations on your success. Thank you. Um, do you have any uh, licensure or graduate degrees or advanced studies in the area of zoning? I don't. Uh, how about land planning? No. Surveying? No. Okay. Um, your testimony uh, regarding uh, being a referral source back and forth between either your own practice or your employer and Mulligan. I know what I'm talking about. Um, your testimony uh, was that they have a very good admissions process and they're known for uh, holding their clients accountable. Yes. Um, have you ever in your private practice or um, for your employer made a referral to Mulligan that was turned down by Mulligan? Yes. Okay. Do you know how many times that's happened? Um, I mean, in my experience, I think it was one time. It might have been a second time, but I know for sure it was at least once. Okay. 
And uh, your testimony regarding uh, the description of a 3.1 level of care facility, I believe you, uh, before you got to the term a bridge, you said, in my experience, uh, to your knowledge, is it a requirement of anybody in a 3.1 level of care to have successfully completed a higher level before they will be admitted? Is it a requirement for 3.1s as a whole or for Mulligan's 3.1? For any 3.1 as no, a whole? No, it's not a requirement, no. Okay. And um, you were present at the prior hearing, I believe you answered, is that correct? Yes. And you heard, um, I don't recall who testified to it specifically, but that uh, more than at least half of the residents at 829 came from out of Carroll County. Do you recall that? Yeah, okay. I don't recall the exact specifics of it, but yes, I know okay. that, was, that was touched on, yes. Okay, so how does that square with your testimony that there is a need for more 3.1 level of care treatment facilities within the county? <coughs> how does it square with that? Meaning, can you explain? Sure, if the testimony is that, and this is my words, if it's more than half, but it's, it's more than zero uh, of the current <coughs> residents at 829 are from out of Carroll County, and you've testified there is at least one, probably two other 3.1 levels level facilities within the county. Mm -hmm. If Mulligan is already receiving clients from out of county, how do you say for certain the county has a need for more 3.1 facilities? I guess in my experience, like when we were working in a treatment center and needing to refer clients that wanted to go into the Carroll County area, like were from there but had gone to treatment maybe in Baltimore County or Baltimore City and wanted to come back to Carroll County, there weren't, often weren't beds available. Um, I mean, that's the best way I could answer that. When is the last time that happened? Um, I would say um, probably like a year ago, but I, that's the last time I was working at the inpatient facility that was referring, so like about a year, maybe 18 months. I don't have anything further. Okay, does anyone in the audience have any questions of Ms. Marcus's testimony? Board members. Okay, thank you, Ms. Thank Marcus. You. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have one quick question on a redirect, if that's allowed. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> just very briefly, uh, Ms. Marcus, um, if you're aware uh, how long has Mulligan been, been operating at this particular property, 829 Franklin Avenue, if you're aware? I'm not sure. Has it been six months? Has it been a year? Objection, asked and answered. At she least said a she year, doesn't but know. I don't know for sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Uh, Baumgartner, would you like to call another witness? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the applicant would like to call Danielle Arters. Good morning, Mr. Artis. If you could please provide the board your full name and your uh, professional um, address. That would be Miss <laughs> Danielle Arters, A-R-T-E-R-S. My address is 529 Congressional Drive. What else did you want? Uh, that's it. Oh, okay. um, who is your employer? Mulligan Recovery Centers. And what is your role with Mulligan? Director of Housing Community Relations. And do you have any um, certifications um, um, uh, currently in this field? I'm a certified peer recovery coach. You were here on August 31st during day one of this hearing, correct? Yes. 
And you heard the testimony of Helen and Brian McCall. Yes. And of Frank Beck. Yes. I'd like to ask you uh, just a few brief questions regarding housing at Mulligan Recovery Centers. Uh, during day one, there was a little bit of confusion with regards to the number of folks in the property currently, what was authorized, and how housing works. Um, can you very briefly explain how the housing component at Mulligan Recovery Centers works specific to this property at 829 Franklin Avenue? Are you talking about how many people are there? Correct. Currently, right now, we are uh, providing care for six clients, and there are two staff members living there. Um, what is the maximum number of residents you are currently authorized to a serve? Eight clients, and we have uh, ten beds are in the house. So if we served eight clients, then we have two staff members in living in the facility. And how do folks find their way to you? Oftentimes referred by treatment centers, um, drug court programs. Uh, we work with a health department, the hospitals in this area. If this application were approved, um, how would those numbers that you just described change? We would be serving two more clients. Would the two staff members who currently reside in the property uh, still reside um, in the property? No, if we were able to serve 10 clients in the house, then the two staff would be transitioned into an apartment or another place to live, which we would help with. Is there currently a wait list for Mulligan? There is. However, we have two beds open uh, because we are very careful about who we accept. I did receive three calls yesterday for women in need, uh, one of which I decided to accept. And uh, the other bed is being held for a woman that we are dealing with with the court system. How many vehicles are currently on site from residents? From residents? Correct. Two. Um, there are four vehicles there at any given time. Two belong to staff. Two belong to the residents there. And when people come in, just if, even if they are allowed, like if they have a legal license and a legal vehicle, it doesn't mean they're allowed to have their vehicle there. What other criteria do you use uh, to, to determine whether or not they are, they are allowed to have their vehicle there? Well, it depends on each individual's uh, recovery process, where they're at. Sometimes a vehicle can be just a trigger. Sometimes a vehicle can be the reason to just go and do the bad things, you know. Um, sometimes a vehicle can lead them to, it, it, they have to be in a good place in their recovery process in order to be responsible enough to be allowed to go out and drive. If you come into our program and you have DUIs in, in your past, it, probably not best you're behind the wheel of a vehicle until you can prove that you are stable. How often would you say you are at this property? Every day. Uh, in your everyday experience, is there uh, parking or traffic congestion along this road? No. Is there parking or traffic congestion throughout this neighborhood? No. Not from our building. There's been some construction at the end of the road from time to time, but yeah. When counselors or clinicians or visitors visit uh, residents at this property, uh, have you ever heard them uh, ever heard them complain about not being able to find parking either on site or directly in front of the property? No. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lazariaga. I guess by way of a clarification, uh, just for my own personal curiosity, Ms. Arders, um, <coughs> If there's a wait list, but the two beds that you talked about, one was just uh, admitted yesterday and one's on hold for somebody in the court system. Mm -hmm. are, when you're talking about a wait list, are you talking about a wait list for 829? Yes. Okay. All right, fair enough. 
Nothing further. Okay. Anyone in the audience have any questions of Ms. Arder's testimony? Go to the microphone, please. Again, state your name, address, and you don't need to spell for the record your last name. You already did that successfully. James Billingsley, Jr., uh, 329 Denton Drive, West Michigan, Real Estate Broker Insurance Agent. So the questions are coming up here that are like making my mind race. So the big question that I heard from Mark Depot's testimony is that even though the state says question of sir it, it, it leads to that. Okay. Okay. Because they said, well, you're supposed to when there's a change of usage, whether the state calls it that or not, that obviously the city or county does. Uh, do you did your company realize that when you changed that? you had to apply for water resources, even for the eight beds or six beds or whatever you're allowed in these types of things. So did you know that you had to apply for that or can you just buy a place and if you can get six beds or eight beds in the building, you can just go ahead and start using it with no other applications? No, we knew we had to apply and we have. You knew you had to apply to increase to eight beds or 10 beds, right? But for 10 beds is considered assisted living. So there's a distinction between what you call it based on the number of beds. Well, at eight beds, it's still residential. Not an assisted living facility? Mm -hmm. It still isn't. considered a residential. That's what it's considered. Well, I I'm not going to beat that part of it to death. I thought I heard something that said, y you know, did you do any uh, construction to get the additional beds in there before? When you had eight beds, did you do construction to create the eight beds? I'm not a construction consultant, sir. I just work there. No, your company bought the property, so did they have to do any construction to create it to eight beds? If you don't know the answer, yeah, you, you no, say, I don't know. I don't know. Because if you don't know, you, uh, if you had to do construction, then a permit would have had to have been applied for, Mr. and then Chairman, the resources, water resources, yeah. would have been met the, prior this, to this is That's I'm testimony. Sorry. That's testimony. I, I, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I will move on. Okay. Anyone else in the audience have questions? Yes, go to the microphone, please. You were a late arriver, correct? Yes, sir, I was. We're going to have to swear you in. It has to do with this testimony I'm just hearing. Okay, so go to the microphone, and I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, and um, now. Other rules. Please state your name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. My name is Thomas Wrightson. I live at 701 William Avenue. I'm retired. My last name is spelled W-R-I-G-H-T-S-O-N. And my question has to do with um, the statement was made about um, the, the parking and driving at 829 specifically. Um, I, I heard spoken that um, in order to drive, one of the, the residents has to be in a good space, has to be in a good place that they are able to drive. Is there any safeguards? My question is, are, are there any safeguards such as breathalyzer things in the cars? And, and I'm only asking this because there is, this is a residential neighborhood mm -hmm. and there are lots of children, mm -hmm. there are lots of, of senior people, me included, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, I'm, I'm concerned for the safety of all the other residents in the neighborhood as to are these people, how do you determine what's a good place? I mean, is it just, are you feeling good today? Or is there some kind of a breathalyzer test or something that they do before they can drive the car? And that's my question. Listen, I appreciate your question greatly and I agree with you. I too myself have three children and there are breathalyzers that are done regularly, daily, every single day. And two of our clients who have the vehicles currently do have programs, work with a program that they have a breathalyzer in their vehicles. Yeah, we are very careful about what happens in the community. We don't play around, we really don't. Well, I would hope not, and again, our concern is the safety of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. you know, we, again, it's a residential neighborhood. Seniors, children, mm -hmm. people walk their dogs all the time, us included. That, that's, you know. that's testimony, Mr. Wrightson. So you have the opportunity, I promise you, that's, to give your own testimony. My question is answered. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, Ms. Kettner. Rebecca Kepner, I live at 824 William Avenue. Um, in talking about moving from eight beds to 10 beds for residents, you spoke that there are two staff currently living in the home um, and that those staff would no longer be living in the home. If this is a 3.1, how are the staff going to be able to oversee the residents if they're not living in the home? Just like anybody would report to any other job, if they're not living in the home, they would still come for their shift. There are two on for a specific shift, and there are two on for night for a specific shift. Our two night staff do not live in the home. Okay. They just report for their shift. Thank you. Any other questions? Go to the microphone. Okay, name, address, <coughs> occupation, spell for the record, your last name. Joni Lane Bind, B I N D, 716 William <coughs> Avenue, retired teacher. Um, you said that uh, you are a certified peer recovery coach, mm -hmm. and you said that you were there every day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know the layout of the house and how things work. I'm curious as to, uh, are there, how many bedrooms are there? Six. Six. So if you get two more people or four more people, people will have to share a bedroom? The beds are already laid up in each bedroom to fit 10 people total. They're, the beds are already set up in each bedroom. The, the beds are already there. The bedroom is already there. It's just empty. Okay. Um, when this house was listed for sale last year, the square footage was noted as 2,233 square feet. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering um, your observations and your professional trained opinion, how do because if you get t two more, there will be 10 residents <clears throat> and two employees. That's 12 people in that square footage. How can this help with recovery? How do they not get on each other's nerves? <laughs> Just human nature. You have to share three bathrooms with 12 people. Yeah. Laundry facilities, cooking, noise. How, how can this help with recovery when there are people who are coming out of what might be the worst time of their lives mm. um, and maybe needing privacy? How does this happen in 2,233 square feet? Well, I will say, if the employees no longer live there, they won't be showering there. And they would probably order lunch like you would at any other job, you know? So it does look a little different. As far as the clients, they look for the staff. The clients all work together. We maintain a very healthy environment of recovery. We are very big on having a, a positive attitude and overall outlook of nothing but recovery in order for them to be a success in society. That is the end goal, to have people coming in to separate from addiction and be successful in society, to be a successful member of this community. These women work together. They work hard. They get along great. They, are, they have savings accounts today. They are going back to school today. They do online courses for their GED, for college. They are working. They are showing up to be able to be their mothers. They are showing up to be able to be daughters. These women are doing amazing things. And if you had seen them six months ago, you'd never believe it. And that is the point of everything that we're doing here today, is to be able to help women be strong women, independent women, members of this society and this community, to be there to show up for everyone in this room at some point or another. It's very important, and the need is there. There are other 3.1s. They have recently closed. 
It recently closed. I am getting bombarded with calls all day long to help people. And I just don't have it. I don't have the resources to be able to do so. Yes, we have a waiting list. We are very particular. And at the end of the day, this is for two beds. However, those two beds are two women who are able to change their entire life. The trauma that these people go through that I hear of when they come into our care, the rapes, the abuse, the being told that they're worthless, that they're nothing. These women are able to turn all of that around. They're able to let go of that trauma. They're able to work with mental health professionals. They're able to do things for themselves and see that they are able to be a healthy member of society. It's very important. The need is there. So each person feels that they have enough privacy? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, go to the microphone, either way. Name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. My name's name. Danny Wilson. I live at 329 Margaret Avenue. Last name, W-I-L-S-O-N. I'm a retired special ed teacher. My question is, I heard you say that you have, you need more space and stuff. How many facilities does Mulligan have total? Not just in our neighborhood, but elsewhere. Or did they just decide they wanted to buy these facilities in our neighborhood and you don't have them elsewhere? That's my question. So I will say this, Mulligan Recovery Centers has two 3.1 facilities and one IOP center. That is what Mulligan Recovery Centers has. Are they in our neighborhood or are they elsewhere? One of those facilities is located in your neighborhood. The other facility is located on Main Street. Okay. Good. That's the question I have. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. <clears throat> Go to the microphone. Did you come in late? No, but I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> So raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear or, or affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Very good. Name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Uh, Earl Meineke. It's M-E-I-N-E-C-K-E, -E, 805 William Avenue, retired. You said you had six bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that can be when most of these homes in this neighborhood only have three. Are people living in the basement? Did you convert other places like a garage or something to a bedroom? Please explain that. What I know is that when I came into that property, there were six bedrooms there. That's what I can attest to. Those six bedrooms are quite comfortable for the people that are staying there, and it has been approved by the fire marshal. That's what I know. That would be something to see, because I don't, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Go to the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you standing at the microphone. My name is Shelly Young. I'm at 645 Denton Drive North. I work for Gold's Gym Eldersburg, but I'm currently on medical leave. My question is that you made the statement about Mulligan Recovery Centers but I would actually like to know how many uh, Mulligan sober living homes you have in the community. Two. Total of two? Mm -hmm. So they're actually in our community as well and not elsewhere? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go, go to the microphone. Name, address. Mm -hmm. Yvonne, Zem Yvonne Zeminski, Z-E-M-I-N-S-K-I. I live at 732 David Avenue, and I'm a retired banker. I would like to know what it qualifies for you to be certified as your peer recovery. What does, and how long have you been certified? Uh, approximately almost a year I've been certified, and you have to take a class and special courses. A number of hours? 
It's a nine month course okay. that you have to take. Okay, and that's all that's required to be that. Mm -hmm. Okay. You Thank have you. to pass the course, but yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, do you know the rate of recidivism um, for your clients? I'm sorry, what was that? I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Do you know the rate of your recidivism where they relapse hmm. of your clients? We have about an 85% success rate. Okay, so 15% can relapse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, anybody can relapse. I have six years myself, and I could go out and relapse. It's the willingness. Sure, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? Board members, questions? I have a question. Ms. Ford Mel. Hi, so you said that there is currently a waiting list, mm -hmm. but there are two staff members that are living at 829. Are they causing the wait list if they didn't hold those beds? No, ma'am. other people be able to come in? No, ma'am, we have two beds. So we're currently serving six clients. We are approved for eight clients. Okay. We have two beds open. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and so you're just being uh, choosy about the two going in there, that's why- Careful, a, yes. I believe that some of them who call and need our help need a little more time in an inpatient treatment center. Um, there's just different things. It's case by case. Some people have to uh, switch um, certain things they're doing in their treatment process where they are at the moment. And then uh, we also work very closely with the court systems and the drug court programs. So making sure that there is a bed available for someone that they would like to refer to us who is, might be a good fit, things like that. Okay, and this is a 3.1 level. Is there something after this or once they pass your program, get through your program, they become part of the community? Well, our 3.1 level of care is set up in a way that uh, it's broken down by phases. When people come in, they have to go through certain phases. And when they come in, we help them get acclimated with all the things that they might need um, to be stable in a community. But they are not allowed to phase up without having stable employment for 60 days, without having a savings account with at least $1,000 in it. Uh, they have to prepare themselves to be able to go out and be, you know, great members of society, stable members in society. Um, so we are tr the goal is to set them up to be able to transition out and live on their own and be successful. Some of them are not prepared to do that when their time is up with us. Some of them will transition on and pay rent at a recovery house elsewhere in the community. Um, for our women, we don't have a step-down program for them to come into a recovery house that is under Mulligan Sober Homes or anything like that. This is our only women's facility, which is why the need is so great. Uh, but we do work closely with other recovery houses in the area, in the community, to see that you know, they have a safe place to go that is recovery-based environment and that they are able to be successful when they leave us. And I apologize, I think I asked this last time, but I don't remember the answer. So um, if half, and that's questionable, but if half of them don't come from this county, do they stay in this county after they get through your program for the most part? Not all of them, no. And a lot of the people, uh, as like Rachel was saying, is that they are here, they are Carroll County members, and the reason they call to come to us is because they, they went out and they got into some stuff and then they went to treatment and they want to come back to what they consider home. And we are the only women's facility currently right now that is operating at this level of care because the other two have recently closed just in the past week. Mm. And how long do you monitor them after they, they get through your program? Well, we set up a, a they, we have an aftercare treatment that they are allowed to step down to and attend. Um, we stay in constant contact with them. We have people who go into an OP program where they come in and they get treatment for an hour once a week. They are able to check in. And all the women that come through our program, I, am, I build a rapport with and uh, maintain relationships with to make sure that they are doing very well. And that's voluntary. They, they that's voluntary. voluntary. They mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Board members, any questions? Thank you for your testament. Wait a minute, do you have any recross? No, sir. Okay. Mr. Lutheran. Oh, no, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great job. Okay, thank you for your testimony. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Chairman, our last witness will be Matthew Stout. Matthew Stout, 3640 Keystone Avenue, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I'm the manager of operations at Foundations Recovery Center. And spell for the record your last name. Sir. Oh, sorry, S-T-O-U-T, like the beer or the teapot. And Mr. Stout, uh, what is uh, Foundations Recovery Center? We are a 30-day partial hospitalization program um, to kind of clarify that it would be before someone steps down to a 3.1 level or a sober living level, we are the intensive 30-day um, um, hospitalization period of intense clinical programming and separation from um, detox or the street varying cases. And what is your role at Foundations? So I uh, manage the operations uh, day to day. Um, we're a seven day a week, 365 day a year operation. Um, oversee all the operations staff, work directly with clinical staff and specifically case management as well. And Mr. Stout, do you have any licenses, certifications or specific training in this field? I do not. I have a degree in journalism that's very uh, irrelevant to, to this <laughs> field. And, and your role with foundations is in operations, correct? Correct. And in that role, you are not required to be certified or licensed? No, sir. Okay. What is your involvement uh, with Mulligan? My direct involvement with them is, uh, I was the case manager uh, at foundations for a um, uh, little over a year before stepping into my current role. Um, and so I was a referrer directly to them um, and now I remain in that state uh, more so as a advocate for certain clients in our program, depending if they meet the requirements of Mulligan um, uh, and kind of holding the standard that Mulligan requires before we refer to Mulligan. And as a referral source, how has your relationship been with Mulligan thus far? Uh, personally, excellent. Professionally, better than that, probably. Will you continue to refer clients to Mulligan? Absolutely. Uh, and Mr. Stout, you were here during the August 31st hearing, um, correct? I was. And you heard the testimony of Helen and Brian McCall? I did. And uh, Frank Beck? I did. Um, and do you understand that this application is to increase Mulligan's capacity from eight beds to residents to 10 beds for residents, correct? That is my understanding. From your position as a referral source for residents to Mulligan, um, will this increase in two beds um, help you to further refer clients and patients to Mulligan? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, and the longer answer is um, historically with Mulligan, we are very picky about who we refer to them to begin with just because of their um, involved admission requirements, and uh, I think I'm at, we're at, uh, we're more at like a 50% approval rate from them, so the, the answer is yes. Um, uh, we wish there were more like Mulligan. Um, outside of Carroll County as well, we wish there were more like Mulligan. Thank you very much, sir. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Lazuriaga. Um, Mr. Stout, have you, um been into the residence at 829 Franklin? I have not been inside of that residence, no sir. And do you have any uh, formal training education or experience in the area of zoning? No sir. Uh, how about surveying? No sir. I don't have anything further. 
Okay, any questions of Mr. Stout's testimony from anyone in the audience? Board members? Oh, wait a minute, go ahead. Okay. Um, Identi quick. Identify yourself, please. Yes, yeah, Rick Dorsey, 716 David Avenue. Um, uh, just a quick question. Uh, as far as relapse rate compared to these folks going back to maybe a family member, which happens sometimes um, if they haven't burned those bridges, what is the relapse rate comparatively to these group homes, um, sober living homes, halfway houses, compared to them living with a family member? Could you shed some light on that, or do you know the statistics, you know, those, those particular um, facts? Thanks. Mr. Chairman, I would, it's a very valid question in terms of recovery, although I would object. Um, it, it wasn't subject to the direct examination. Um, I'm a little bit fuzzy on the question, and, I, and since we're offering Mr. Stout as a witness, merely as a referral source for Mulligan, uh, I, I don't think we've qualified him to answer that question directly. Could, could, could you restate your question as it relates to what his testimony was and as it relates to Mulligan? Okay. I'd Thank be you. happy to talk to you after, too, um, a bit more about that. Mr. Parrish. Hi, my name is Bruce Parrish. I live at 260 Sophia Avenue. I work for Social Security Administration, and uh, my last, last name is spelled P-A-R-R-I-S-H. Uh, my question for Mr. Stout is, where is your facility located? Baltimore County. Baltimore County. I can give you an exact address as well, okay. if that's helpful. Um, so you're, you're referring people from Baltimore County to a group home in Carroll County, correct? Yes, however, we get referrals to us from Carroll County. Often that is the first filtering process for considering Mulligan, um, is bringing a Carroll County resident back to Carroll County through the proper, uh, the best care and through the proper channels. Okay, um, great. We Thank get you. a tremendous amount from Carroll That's County. That's my question. Any other questions? Board members, questions on Mr. Stout's testimony? Thank you, Mr. Stout. Thank you so much. Mr. Baumgartner, you had said in the previous uh, uh, hearing that you wanted to be able to recall any of your witnesses. Do you want to recall any of your witnesses? If you would have asked me that question before Mr. Depot's testimony, I would have said no. Um, but I think we'll leave that uh, to address during closing, and I don't believe we, uh, that we'll be recalling any witnesses at this time. Okay. At, at this point, let's go ahead and take about a five or a ten minute break. We're about halfway between here and the beginning and lunchtime. We'll go ahead and call the BZA meeting back to order. Mr. Baumgartner, before we get started, no, no second guessing, you're, you're that's, done? That's correct, sir. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lazariaga, Mr. Mr. Lazariaga, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You, you can call, you can, uh, you already had your opening statement. Yes. Uh, so uh, with that, if you want to call witnesses, uh, go, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, my first witness would be to my direct left, Katie Townsley. Uh, Ms. Townsley, uh, can you uh, provide your name, uh, spelling your first and last, and occupation and address for the record? Uh, my name is Catherine Legally, K-A-T-H-R-I-N-E, last name Townsley, T-O-W-N-S-L-E-Y. I live at 731 David Avenue. Sorry, I'm going to reconfigure this if that's all right with Mr. Can it reach? I'll sit here. 
Um, uh, Ms. Townsley, what do you do professionally? Uh, my career is that I am the Development and Community Engagement Manager for the Carroll County Public Library Systems. I'm also a 21-year member of the Recent Community Volunteer Fire Department, where I hold the um, elected position as Vice President, and I am also the Public Information Officer and Chairman of the Board. Surprised you have time to be here today. There's more. <laughs> um, and you gave your address uh, for the board. Uh, do you live in the Fairfield neighborhood? I have, I do, yes. And how long have you lived there? I was born and raised at 736 David Avenue, where I lived um, through co up until college. I left for college and graduate school, and then I bought my home um, in 2007 back in the neighborhood. Where you live presently? Correct. Okay. Um, how and when did you first become aware of Mulligan's presence within your neighborhood? Um, I have my dog owner, and I walk my dogs twice a day, and I did notice the first house moving into the neighborhood um, in the fall of 2021. And which um, address was that? 829 Franklin. Okay. And that's the case we're here, or house we're here to talk about today? That is correct. All right. Um, what, what specifically did you observe? Um, increase in, um, obviously, the, the residents had moved from being a family to no longer seeing the children um, and, the, and the family who was there to being um, more of a transient traffic with um, unfamiliar faces in the neighborhood of vehicles that we weren't familiar with, um, cars parking um, on the street and not just in the driveway. Most of our neighbors park, if they can, in their driveway or in their garage, um, but there was more um, vehicles um, on the street some without a state tags, which is always alarming. Okay, um, 829 specifically, uh, had prior to Mulligan's occupation of that house, have you ever been inside of it? I have not. Okay. Um, since the occupation of 829 Franklin by Mulligan, have you noticed any increase in vehicular traffic? Yes. Uh, can you describe approximate amounts times of day, anything like that that you recall? Um, well, in the evenings, uh, well, throughout the day, and this is, are we specifically talking about the 829 or are we talking about Mulligan in general in the neighborhood? Let's uh, start with 829. Okay. Um, so the, I, do, you do notice the traffic coming up and down Franklin Avenue. You do notice the traffic coming into David Avenue, which is the direct route to Route 32 where I live. Um, and then Franklin Avenue where the house is, is they would go up and down that to be able to exit either out to 32 or to 97. Um, depending on that so um, yes but is there anything that um, you've noted that can help you specifically attribute this traffic to Mulligan Recovery Services um, so they do have a van that they operate in the neighborhood and also Carroll Transit um, is now in the neighborhood um, making stops at the homes uh, delivering clients um, since uh, 829 Franklin became occupied by Mulligan. Have you noticed any change in noise levels in the community? Uh, occasionally, yes. Can you describe those? Um, they've had several uh, gatherings um, that we have witnessed. There's been their um, increase then uh, with the parking on the street, um, specifically that makes it more difficult with uh, vehicles getting through the neighborhood. Um, and then as far as they have a large in-ground pool in the back of the um, house where they do tend to have gatherings. Um, same question, since they started occupying 829, have you noticed any increase in pr trash production at uh, that location? Um, most homes do put out two trash cans, which is allotted by most uh, trash companies for residential facilities. Um, the, this particular home has five uh, trash cans. And is there any other type of activity which I have not asked you about that you have noticed in the neighborhood since Mulligan started occupying 829 Franklin? Um, Ms. McCall did testify regarding the um, assistance uh, that was given to a drug bust that happened in the neighborhood. That is not something that we have typically had um, it, prior to that, but she did mention that the residents um, assisted in uh, the, the identification of the individual who was involved in that matter. Um, there are differing opinions regarding that, though. Well, uh, let me ask you specifically, do you, are you aware of the circumstance that she described and what happened? For the drug bust? Yes. Yes, sir. What is your recollection of what occurred? Um, that there was an individual um, in a vehicle who um, 
was from Baltimore who was found um, at a home on David Avenue, um, which is also a sober living home that was uh, mentioned last uh, hearing as having relations with Mulligans, even though they are not associated or owned and operated together, but they um, do collaborate and um, assist each other's clients. Um, where the vehicle was found and there was a large amount of drugs found in there as well as weapons. Um, there was a high-speed police chase that occurred in the neighborhood with over um, 20 law enforcement offices from multiple jurisdictions um, and an arrest of two individuals was made that day. And that was in July of this year? That is correct. All right. Um, I'm going to show you <clears throat> what I have marked. as opposition one um can you tell me what we're looking at here uh this is a map of the, the map of the plots of the neighborhood known as fairfield um that is provided by the county it was part of the packet of information that was um in your exhibits when the um application was filed okay and is it fair to say is this from uh, a zoom in of the tax map it is a zoom in yes sir of the document that was in there um, application. Okay. And have you made any uh, highlights or markings on this document? Um, I did highlight the plot number as um, 107, which is in pink or in, with a black marking around it, and that is 829 Franklin Avenue. Okay. So 107 is the lot number within the development, not the address. That is correct. Okay. And I see there are three other lots that have been marked or otherwise highlighted. What are those? Um, number 12 is also a Mulligan property, and that's located at 744 David Avenue. That was the second property that they purchased. Um, and number 85 is 802 Franklin Avenue, which is the third property that they have purchased within the last year um, on Franklin Avenue. And number 35 um, is, I don't remember the house, I think it's 803 David Avenue, which is uh, known as Maddie House, which um, the... Um, Mulligan has testified that they have relations with to help their clients. Okay. And um, did you prepare this exhibit as far as the highlights uh, to provide the board with a visual depiction of how close in proximity some of these locations are? I did. Are you aware of any other neighborhood in Carroll County who has four uh, assisted living or recovery houses within the same area as shown on this map? I am not. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would move for admission of opponents one. No objection. Oh, Mr. Dixon's going to help me out. Thank you, sir. And we will accept that into evidence. Now, I know I just took the uh, map away from you, Ms. Townsley, but uh, for context, it, it's okay. I don't need it. Thank you. Um, how, how close are these houses to each other uh, in, if you were to walk from one to the other? They're within 500 yards from the furthest house to the closest house. They're within two blocks of each other. Okay. And approximately, if you're walking your dog, how long would it take for you to get from one to the other? It depends which house you're leaving from. If you're leaving from the two houses on Franklin, it would take you less than two minutes um, down the house. There's maybe six houses between them. If that, I don't have the map in front of me to physically count. If you're leaving from the house on David Avenue to go to the house on Franklin, it may take you five minutes. Um, it's just around the corner. Have you ever personally observed pedestrian traffic between Mulligan locations? I have. And uh, at what times of day? All hours of the day and the night. When you say all hours of the night, how late are you talking about? Um, I've observed traffic coming into the homes on David Avenue, specifically since that is where I live, um, up at, at 10 o'clock in the evening. I've seen traffic that has come in after uh, the curfew that they mentioned as well. Okay, and you were present uh, at the first hearing date in this case, is that right? Yes, sir. And you were there throughout the entire hearing, is that correct? Yes, sir. Do you recall, uh, for the most part, all of the testimony provided by each of the three witnesses on behalf of the applicant that day? I do. Now, specifically, do you recall a discussion regarding an open house at 829 Franklin at which nobody showed up? I do. Um, what, if anything, do you have to add regarding how that came to be? Um, on or about August the 13th, Mr. Bumgardner communicated with you, um, our attorney, that Mulligan wished to have, host an open house 
on the um, 19th of August, which was a Friday. I was out of town, but I conversed with my two uh, colleagues who are the named clients in this matter, um, and we arranged a date and time for that to happen, which did involve all three of us making accommodations to fit the time that Mulligan had proposed to us to have the meeting. We agreed for a meeting to happen on Friday evening, um, August the 19th at 7 p.m., which all three of us had made arrangements to attend. Um, we were then notified by email by Mr. Bumgardner at 8.30 on Thursday evening that the clients needed to make arrangements to cancel the meeting and that they, to notify his clients, which as he has testified, as Mr. Lazaria has indicated, are both uh, Mr. Dorsey, Ms. Alcorn, and myself, um, and that they were hoping to be able to reschedule. However, there was no confirmation that came back from the attorney of the rescheduling date for the following weekend, or the following week that uh, Ms. McCall had indicated. Okay. And I never received, I do believe that they testified that there were flyers that were handed out. However, I never received a flyer regarding the um, change of date um, or time for the open house that they had done in order to be able to communicate it to the community. Do you have any idea why the original date was canceled? I do not know. Um, you may have touched on this already, but you also, um, on the first day, did you hear testimony regarding the specific curfew kept by Mulligan at 829? Uh, they mentioned that there was a 9 p.m. curfew. I don't know if it specifically replied to Mulligan or uh, to um, the 829 Franklin or all of their residents, but they, it was a 9 p.m. curfew that was mentioned. And your testimony here today is you've seen, is it vehicular, foot, or both traffic coming to and from a Mulligan location after 9 p.m.? Uh, both and also uh, bicycle. The bicycle traffic that you're aware of, um, is that uh, a resident? Uh, we don't know. It's in the evening. It's picked up on ring cameras. Okay. Uh, specifically regarding 829 Franklin, are you aware of an instance uh, in the late summer of this year where there was an unattended outdoor bonfire at that location? Um, a confirmation for that is it was November 1st, uh, 2021, I apologize, um, on that date of an unattended bonfire in the backyard, which was after the occupants had taken possession of the home. Okay. I mean, was it contained to a fire pit? It was a large fire um, with flames that were uh, alarming next to a shed and next to adjoining properties with siding on the home um, that was of concern. Have you ever witnessed any loud behavior or arguments in front of a mulligan location in your neighborhood? Um, I have, yes. On how many occasions? On numerous occasions. Um, are they loud enough for you to hear the substance of the argument? Uh, they are. And is it your understanding, uh, are the arguments between residents or people that are totally unrelated or both? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe that they are involving residents and or maybe counselors who are there to pick them up. Um, there are some also altercations that have happened on the street that have been directed towards uh, neighbors who have um, addressed the residents of the home. Are you aware of any other members of your neighborhood community who have expressed if or how Mulligan's presence has diminished their peaceful enjoyment of your neighborhood? Um, aside from the amount of people who are in the room, um, we do have several residents who have put their homes on the market um, in order to remove themselves um, from the, the neighborhood that they had bought into because the peaceful enjoyment has now diminished as a result of these that were living homes being in our neighborhood. Mr. Chairman, I would object to the question and the answer. I understand this is an um, administrative proceeding and hearsay is permitted, um, but there's a level of hearsay and if my understanding of Ms. Townsley's testimony is correct, she's speaking to generally other individuals in the neighborhood that may or may not have moved out of the neighborhood um, for various reasons. I, that's a, that's and, a bit and of a- I, I understand your concern, and I think you can address that when you uh, ask her questions of her testimony. Thank you, sir. Okay. So to expound on that point a little bit, we'll see how many objections we get through. Um, are you aware of how many 
have any residences within your neighborhood been listed for or sold within the past 60 days? Yes. Do you know how many? There are four. Come on, Mr. Boyd. <laughs> um, okay. I want to ask you about the lot for 829 Franklin specifically. You testified that you were not, you've never been in the home, but uh, you've highlighted it on op opposition one as number 107, is that right? That is correct. Is it fair to say in your understanding that lot is the same size as just about every other lot in your neighborhood? That is correct. I don't have anything further. <coughs> Mr. Baumgartner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Townsend, good morning. Good morning. Just a couple follow-up questions for you based upon Mr. Lazariaga's questions. Uh, in your testimony, you had said that you had noticed out-of-state tags uh, in the neighborhood after Mulligan purchased their property, uh, and that was a warning. Um, what kind of warning would that be? Objection. That wasn't her testimony. She said alarming. Could you turn your mic on? On? Is it, is it on? Okay. okay. Then alarming. Um, what might be alarming about out-of-state tags? Um, most of the time within living, if you're a resident within the community, you change your tags to your permanent living address within a couple of days or weeks with moving into the residence. And um, with some of the residents that they have, they do not have, they still have their out-of-state tags versus permanent residency tags. You had also testified that with regard to vehicular traffic, that there was a van that Mulligan um, owned or operated and that you had seen the Carroll Mobility services in your neighborhood, correct? That's correct. The van being specific, but the Carroll Mobility services operates throughout the county, correct? That is correct. So it could serve other homes as well? That is correct. Is the Fairfield community under any uh, HOA or uh, community association? It is not. Are there any rules in the county that prevent gatherings outdoors um, in the Fairfield uh, there, community? No. So other properties could also have outdoor gatherings? That's correct. Are there any rules that you're aware of that would prohibit five trash cans outside? No. That's up to the trash company, but most, like as I said, my agreement with my trash company, which services them on the same pickup days, has told me that I'm allowed two trash cans and one recycling can. With regard to the, um, I don't know if we call it a drug bust or a drug arrest, um, you had referred to it as a drug bust. You had testified that, um, at least to your knowledge, that that incident had either started or um, was somehow centered around um, another sober living home, correct? That is correct. Okay. So that, to your knowledge, that incident did not have to deal with 829 Franklin Avenue? That incident does not have to deal with 829 Franklin Avenue. However, there is another incident involving an arrest that does involve a mulligan home in the neighborhood that I can attest to if you would like. Um, and you had testified that there are, uh, and per this exhibit, um, there are four either 3.1 or you know, other residential treatment uh, centers um, in this community, correct? That is correct. If you know, how many homes or lots are in this community? 134. So four out of that 134, correct? That is correct. You also testified with regard to uh, seeing increased pedestrian traffic, uh, and you also stated that this was between Mulligan locations, correct? That's correct. Okay. The four residential treatment, sober living um, homes within this community, the two are on the same street, correct? Uh, Franklin Avenue? That's correct. 
and then two are on a different street, correct? That's correct. Okay. Can you explain to the board how you would be able to discern if vehicles or pedestrians or bicycles were traveling between different locations on different streets? As I mentioned, I am a dog owner and I walk my dog several times a day. Um, in the evenings, they do move um, between homes, I'm assuming after meetings or, or, or whatnot. Um, so I have witnessed that because I have been either following them or observed traffic behind me or approached them, seeing them from which direction they're coming from. We also have cameras. Um, I personally have cameras on my home, as do many of my neighbors um, who could attest to that, should they choose to make a comment along those lines as well. You had also testified that you had witnessed loud arguments in front of a mulligan location. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, which property? 744 David. And that's not the property that we're here for today, correct? That is not. Okay. You also stated that you had seen this occur numerous times. That is correct. Um, do you have dates and times when those occurred? Um, I can specifically testify to an arrest that happened at 744 David Avenue on uh, July the 28th um, at around 10.30 p.m. involving one of their residents who was taken into custody by the Sheriff's Department and also um, uh, comments that were made regarding items that were in a pickup truck which was then um, quickly removed from the premises uh, by um, individuals who I could not identify standing across the street to watch but uh, did attest and to witness the uh, conversation which uh, the Carroll County Sheriff's Office is made aware of. And then uh, regarding another specific incident, I don't have the exact date, but it was in the morning uh, while walking the dog um, around 7 a.m. Um, individual did not want to get into their vehicle. Uh, I don't know who it was, but a resident of 744 did not want to get the, into the vehicle of um, whomever it was and was um, making a, a ruckus and uh, using profanity at a loud rate this summer. Um, I would probably assume that was, um, I'm guessing, in, in, in August. Um, shortly before the last hearing. And to your knowledge, is 744 David Avenue a level 3.1 service location? Uh, they have testified that it is not a 3.1 level uh, facility. And lastly, you had stated that, uh, at least to your knowledge, there were four homes uh, in the Fairfield community that had been either listed for sale or sold in the last 60 days. Is that correct? That is correct. So that's four homes of the, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, was 134? That is correct. Those are all the questions I have at this time. Okay, does anyone in the audience have any questions of Ms. Townsley's testimony? Questions of her testimony? Good morning, Ms. Townsley. Rick Dorsey, 716 David Avenue, real estate. Um, out of the homes that are for sale in the neighborhood, um, how many are neighbors of Mulligan homes, either touching the property or across the street, that are for sale that have just gone on the market in the last 30 days? Um, 215 Rose Avenue is two doors down from 829 Franklin Avenue. Um, 745 David Avenue is directly across the street from 744 David Avenue, which is a Mulligan home, and 740 David Avenue is directly next door to um, 744 David Avenue, which is a Mulligan recovery home or sober living home. Okay, before you go further, no further questions. Is he one of your clients, Mr. Dorsey? Yes. Sorry. It, it would probably that, that, be more that, proper. That's inappropriate for you for an outburst like that. It would probably be more proper if Mr. Dorsey did not ask questions directly of the witness. Okay. But I think uh, that's all I'll say. Okay. Thank you. Yes, go to the microphone and please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Helen McCall, and I'm with Mulligan Recovery Centers, and I live at 754 Mulligan Lane, Westminster, Maryland. Mr. Bale, before she asks a question, this is along the lines of what just occurred. It is, yeah. It, it, 
I I'm sorry, Ms. McCall. Oh, I'm sorry. Be because you're represented by legal counsel, it would. I thought it was you, opposite. You, we were if allowed. You have, if you have a question, you could have sorry, the question Sorry, I misunderstood. Answered, answered okay. Through your attorney. Yeah, but he did, but we cut him off, okay? Anyone else in the audience have any questions of um, Ms. Townsley's testimony? Ms. Kepner. Rebecca Kepner, 824 William Avenue. Uh, Ms. Townsley, have you spoken with any of the families who have listed their homes for sale? I have. Have they identified why they have put their homes up for sale? Um, some have directly, yes. Can you explain what they had given to you? I understand that this is hearsay, but I wondered if you could elaborate on that, please. And I would object, uh, Mr. Chairman. It is... Um, Unless they're here to testify, it is hearsay, so you, you, don't, we, you really can't answer that question. That's fine. Anyone else have any questions? I'll give Mr. Baumgartner a second to look over what was just handed him. <laughs> uh, not at this time, sir. Okay. Board members, any questions? Very good. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Zuriaga, would you like to call another witness? Okay. Uh, can you two switch seats? Yep. Yes. I'd like to call Cecilia Alcorn. And I did not swear in. Okay. Thanks for your honesty. Sure. Uh, do you swear or affirm under penalties of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Very good. Thank you. Name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Cecilia Alcorn, that's A-L-C-O-R-N, address 218 Rose Avenue, occupation retired forensic analyst, and I'm a current business owner in downtown Westminster. Okay. Uh, Ms. Alcorn, can you provide some context for the board uh, where your residence is compared to 829 Franklin Avenue? Sure, I am two doors down from 829 Franklin. Okay, are you on the same side of the street? I'm Did adjacent. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, all right, so generally speaking, uh, when did you become aware of Mulligan's uh, presence within the Fairfield neighborhood? I believe when I, when I first started seeing the van, more than anything. Okay. Do you recall approximately when that was? That was probably nine months ago. All right. And let me direct your attention specifically to uh, when did you become aware of Mulligan's occupation of the property at 829 Franklin? Well, if I could go back a little further, I became concerned when the house was being rehabbed. Okay. And what did what concerned you? I knew the previous owners, and I've been in the home, and just given a little background information. And when I'd heard that the home was purchased, and bought for cash, and I said I thought to myself, are they flipping this house? Well, they couldn't probably because there was a pool in the backyard. Normally, you don't flip a house and. Well, not flip it, but they didn't think they would be renting it. I should say. I should correct that. And um, so I was concerned about who was moving into the home. So I, what, I always walked my dogs and I noticed who was rehabbing it. And one day toward the end, I had asked the gentleman who was rehabbing, hey, are you guys flipping the house? Or are you going to live here? And he told me they were going to live there. But then it was very quiet for a while. And the next thing you know, I started noticing the van going from house to house. And I thought it looked like a party van to me, to be honest. And I thought, what the heck's going on? But then I noticed it frequently going through the neighborhood. Um, so that was, like I said, about nine months ago that I noticed that. 
Um, well, let me um, direct your uh, testimony a little bit farther. So you had been in the home prior to its purchase by who you now know to be B Elite, uh, the ownership entity? Correct. Um, how many bedrooms did you observe in the house when you were there? Three bedrooms upstairs, and they had one child downstairs in a room. Um, is there anything that you're able to testify to specifically about your observations in how the house was rehabbed or remodeled? Do you know what was done? I know that they appeared to be working on the garage first because I have a direct sight line from my house. And they spent a lot of time in the garage, which has now been turned to, into a bedroom as well. Um, downstairs, like I said, they had one child down there, and my friends who lived in the home sold because their in-laws needed to move into the home, but they didn't have room for their in-laws in addition to having three children plus the two adults. Okay. Um, have you noted any increase in the amount of traffic, be it vehicular, pedestrian, or bicycle since Mulligan has started occupying 829 Franklin. I've seen a ton of vehicular traffic, foot traffic. One occasion in particular, I have dogs that are up in our windows and constantly notice anything or anybody that walks past our house and they bark a lot. So they continue to bark and I thought someone must be doing something out front, daylight hours. And I noticed a young, well, probably a guy around 30, I'm guessing, and a woman walking together coming from the direction of 829 Franklin. And he had dreadlocks. I remember that. But what I thought was really odd is they stopped in my yard. She was in the road, but he was halfway up into my property line, and my dogs were going crazy. And I looked at the guy, and I thought, okay. I didn't really recognize him, saw where they were coming from. And then he was looking in my house in broad daylight. So I just backed away from the window and continued to observe. And then he walked back to the young woman. And then they went back toward, again, they were walking this way, and they went back toward the location of 829 Franklin. They got down about one house, kitty corner from my house, stopped, lit up something, and then he passed it to her. And then they turned back around after smoking whatever they were smoking, went, came back the same direction again, and he immediately came halfway up into my yard. Once again, the dogs are going ballistic again. And then they made a right-hand turn onto William, which my house is on the corner of Rose <coughs> and William. They walked down approximately two houses and went across the street, stopped in front of another neighbor's house, and the girl stopped at the mailbox, facing the mailbox, and then just started kicking something on the ground. Then they turned back from the direction they turned around, came back up toward the corner of Rose and William, and made a right onto Rose to the original direction they were walking, which would have led to David Avenue. And they went in that direction. So I thought it was very odd behavior. They seemed out of sorts. Didn't go out and say anything or approach them, of course. Uh, but it was alarming. Most people don't come up into your resident or up into your property line like that. Most people stay on the street. We don't have sidewalks. But it was very odd behavior. Bigger picture question, not so uh, specific incident driven. Um, the amount of foot traffic to and from 829 Franklin, how does it compare to the remainder of your street? Say it again, please. Sure. The amount of foot traffic to and from 829 Franklin, is it more or less or the same as most of the houses on your street? Oh, it's exponentially more. And at what times of day? All hours. What's the latest you've personally observed? Foot traffic to and from the whole area as late as 10 o'clock at night where people are walking on the streets. Again, we don't have sidewalks. Um, have you ever personally observed any issues or complications with parking at 829 Franklin? There have been several occasions where they appear to have parties. Um, 
multiple cars. I've seen probably up to eight cars. Even when the driveway has open spots, they tend to park on the street. And, and they just got that driveway repaired, the previous owners, so they have a nice big parking pad. Um, has the presence of the existing use at 829 Franklin affected your ability to peacefully enjoy your home? Yes. In what way? Fear of what is going on, especially after the big drug bust that happened, and having unknown people walking on the streets at night. I walk my dogs a lot too. I have two children. Um, but fear is one of the largest things. Not knowing constant different faces. Um, anything regarded to noise, trash production, vibrations, anything like that that occurs that you've experienced inside your home? Um, traffic, of course, has, I mean, I mean, trash has increased for those homes. Okay. Noises, we just got new windows. It was pretty loud before that, <laughs> so. Okay. I don't have anything further. Mr. Baumgartner. Yes, sir, just a couple questions for uh, Ms. Alcorn. Um, good morning, ma'am. You had testified that you had first noticed the presence of Mulligan because of the van, and you had said that was about nine months ago, correct? Correct. Okay. Would it surprise you to learn that that van wasn't purchased until April of 2022? Well, the B Elite van, too was there for rehab. They have two vans that are black. You also testified that there was an increase in uh, traffic um, when Mulligan moved into the property, is that correct? Correct. And including in that traffic was an increase in foot traffic, is that correct? Correct. Is increase in foot traffic in a community a bad thing? When you're unsure of what's going on, it can be a bad thing. And when they're walking onto your property. Um, with regard to the incident that you described with the, uh, the man and the woman uh, who were on your yard. Uh, did Just you the man, the woman wasn't. Okay. Um, did you personally see those individuals come from either 829 Franklin or another Mulligan property? No, as I stated, I noticed them coming from the direction of 829, came up to my property, stopped, turned around, went back toward what I believed was 829, then came back, went down the street, one house, one and a half, two houses, came back up, and then proceeded west on Rose toward David Avenue. That's all the information I have. So they could have been neighbors that lived in the community elsewhere? I've never seen those neighbors before, and I've met all of our neighbors since, so they were not neighbors that own houses in our neighborhood. And Ms. Alcorn, uh, is it safe to say that you are opposed to this application today? I am oppo I'm opposed to the increase in beds, correct. If instead of the uh, alcohol and substance use disorder um, treatment model that we've been talking about here, if this assisted living facility were to be serving um, elderly residents, would you also be opposed? Objection. How's that relevant? Goes to the source of her opposition. I, I, think, I think the question is designed to open a sense of argument that the general opposition to this is discriminatory in nature because of the use. I think you'll hear in closing, it is purely academic. So I don't think a hypothetical as to what else this property could be used for is appropriate. I'll withdraw the question. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have for this witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. 
Does anyone in the audience have questions of Ms. Alcorn's testimony? Board members, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Luzuriaga, would you like to call another witness? Uh, depends on the answer to this next question. Um, I do have an exhibit that I was hoping would have made it into the file and perhaps Mr. Dixon can tell me it has and then this is um, not necessary. But I have a copy of a letter written August 22nd, 2022 by Delegate April Rose that's addressed specifically to the BZA. Do we? That's in the file. That is it's in the in file? The okay. Then uh, you hang on. A letter to from it. April Rose and a letter from uh, Senator Reedy? Yes. Okay. They're in the file. Um, Mr. Bale, at this point, I don't have any further witnesses. I expect there's going to be a number from the community, but I don't have any further. Okay, very good. Thank you. Now the moment you all have been waiting for. <laughs> so you can go to the microphone, please. Name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. And you can give your testimony. It doesn't have to be in the form of a question. Mr. Billingsley. Thank you. James Billingsley, real estate broker, insurance agent, 329 Denton Drive, Westminster, Maryland. You know, I've heard a lot of testimony about the usage here, and it's clear that this is only about giving two more beds. And, uh, you know, they asked me to speak about real estate values. It's kind of a no-brainer to know that this would have either a perceived and or a real negative impact on any neighborhood. So therefore, in the initial section, when there's still properties that uh, are available and still investors that uh, are looking to do this kind of thing in these neighborhoods, it could have an impact of raising the values. And then as more of those go in the neighborhood, which is in some ways a form of either unintentional or intentional blockbusting, that there could be a big supply of people going to sell, and then in that fact, it would have a drop eventually in real estate values. You know, when I heard Mark Depot make his testimony, I thought, well, this is the end. I believe that the board does not have a choice to approve this because I think that the water resource has been put out and they're not going to approve that water resource. He already testified to that. So I don't see how the hearing panel can then approve something that doesn't have the water resources. I wonder in the past when these things were renovated and it went from what may have been four bedrooms, three up, one down, to six bedrooms, two more down, that they didn't have an issue with water resources when they did the uh, rehab. Is that slipping through the cracks of the government? So if that's not enough to give the ruling that says we cannot approve this, think in terms of how quickly this started to happen and how quickly a neighborhood got inundated with a number of these kinds of units. And, you know, I think in some jurisdictions they have a density issue. No more than one per square mile or something like that would protect any individual neighborhood of being inundated with, you know, more than one of these types of facilities. So in that, in that case, I would encourage you to, to, to deny this request on those two reasons and let the county government, you know, I'm part of the uh, government affairs of the local association of realtors. So I've gone to them and I've said to my fellow realtors, have you realized this is happening? It's at like lightning speed. I'm hearing things like, well, you know, now Medicaid is paying or maybe the investors just found out that Medicaid was paying. So they're going to end up being able to get a higher than market value rent for a property that they purchase. The average family could not pay that. That has a negative impact then on the community and housing. So from that perspective, um, you know, I, I think we need to go forward as a group here. And uh, the new commissioners are just coming in, so I've not contacted. The, most of them are going out. But we need to go to our elected officials and say, you need to do as quickly as possible, get some ordinance in places to protect these communities that feel like or realize that this is a negative impact. Okay, does any, Mr. Baumgartner. Just one quick question uh, to clarify Mr. Billingsley's testimony. Uh, sir, did I hear you correctly that you said that the approval of this use 
at least in the short term, could increase property values? Yeah, because there's other investors finding out where the money trail is coming from, which is always seems to be the government of one description or another, and they've found that money trail, and they know I, don't, I didn't do the research to find out how much per bed they get, how much above the current market value for renting a property would be. So I don't have those specific answers, but it's obvious when they're buying these kinds of places that it's profitable. And I, don't, you know, I have experience with, I don't think you can go very far with any family and not see someone who has suffered from the opioid crisis that's out there. All families are involved in that. I know we need a need for those, we have a need for those kind of things. But, you know, you get to the high-end houses, the people make a lot of money in these kinds of investments. Financially, it can't work in their neighborhoods, so they become insulated from it. They come out and put them in other middle-class neighborhoods, and I think that's a negative impact. And, you know, but we are speaking to this two more bed. Everybody's clear, but a lot of the testimony has gone beyond that. So the water allocation is not there. I don't know how any zoning board could approve two more beds when the city of Westminster official told me the water allocation is not there and it's unknown how long it'll be until the allocation will be there. Any other questions of him? Wait a minute, Mr. Billingsley, we're not done with you. And, and while, he's, while he's going back to the microphone, I want to make it perfectly clear because things have gotten out of hand in other hearings. When you go to the microphone to give your testimony, you get one shot at that microphone. So make sure that you, your testimony is that. I'm not going to give you the second chance. Okay? I got a lot of stuff I could say, but it all speaks to the overall picture of the impact of one of these or multiple places in neighborhoods. I know we have a need for them. I don't know where to say for them to go, but I know no one's going to be happy in residential neighborhoods. Okay, stay there. Anyone, anyone in the audience have any questions of Mr. Billingsley's testimony? Board members, any questions of Mr. Billingsley's testimony? Okay, now you can go back to your seat. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anyone else want to give testimony? Go ahead, go, go ahead and just form a line at the microphone so that we can expedite the process a little. Be careful on the steps, everybody. Go ahead. Jo Joan Elaine Bean, 716 William Avenue, retired teacher, former real estate agent. I'd like to uh, quote from the Carroll County Code of Ordinances, Chapter 1. 58 Zoning Regulations, Section 158.002. It stipulates that a variance is a, quote, relaxation by the Board of Zoning Appeals of the terms of this chapter. I'm sorry, I just closed it. Okay. Uh, of the terms of this chapter, except where specifically prohibited, in accordance with sections 158.130 and 158.133, where such a variance will not be contrary to the public interest, and where, owing to conditions peculiar to the property and not the results of the actions of the applicant, a literal enforcement of the chapter would result in practical difficulty or unreasonable hardship. According to this quote, I'm sorry, end quote. According to this quote, whatever difficulty the applicant might experience by your rejection of this application must be owing to conditions peculiar to the property and not the result of the actions of the applicant. I have not been inside this property, but I have seen the lot from the outside. It is about the same size as other lots on the street. Geographically, geologically, there are no conditions peculiar to this property that would warrant a zoning variance. It would only be because Mulligan 
has chosen to use this property to house eight or 10 people in a home designed for a single family and sized for a single family. There are no conditions particular to the property that would warrant a variance. Thank you. Okay, any questions of Ms. Bean's testimony? Could you spell your last name? B as in boy, I-N-D. I know the pr pronunciation is a little bit unusual. And I didn't give you, Mr. Baumgartner, any questions of her testimony? No, sir. Board members, thank you for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have not been. Oh, thank, thank you for your honesty. Okay, so raise your right hand. Do you, do you swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. My name is Joanne Wrightson, W-R-I-G-H-T-S-O-N. I live on 701 William Avenue, and I'm a retired teacher. Um, this whole hearing, we keep saying there's four group homes in our neighborhood. There's five. I live right next door to the Target House, and the Target House is amazing. They did it right. When Mr. Zerpoli came in and they were building it, they came over to the neighbors, they introduced themselves, they gave us their card, told us if there was any problems, please feel free to talk with them. Once the home was built, he came over, took us through. There's four bedrooms, so they have four clients, one per bedroom. The basement is for the two people that manage the home. They go to McDaniel College to get their masters. Mr. Zerpoli periodically would come by and see if there was any problems. I know he's retired now, but it is run extremely well. To me, that is an extremely well-run place. So not only do we have the four new ones, we have five. So my question is, how many are you gonna allow in one neighborhood? We already have five. Mr. Baumgartner, any questions of Ms. Wrightson's testimony? No, sir. Board members? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Joanne. Did you have a question of her testimony? Uh, I did, but that's No, no, go, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. You have questions of Ms. Wrightson's testimony. I, I, didn't, I did not see you. That's okay. I'm pretty loud. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers have to project. Ms. Yeah, but Ms. we Wright need you on the microphone. It won't, it won't pick up on the recording. Go, go ahead and ask your question as she's okay. approaching the microphone. Rebecca Kepner, 824 William Avenue. Ms. Wrightson, you testified that the owners of the assisted living that is directly across the street from you came to you before they built the house. Was yes. that an empty lot before? Yes, it was an empty lot. Yes, so, so they had to go through all the zoning process request water use, all of those things, I, to your I understanding. I did, yes. And you said that he came to you before he built the house. What, did he explain why he came to you before they built the property? He just wanted to let us know what was going in there. And, because we were concerned when they started. And we had heard it was a target house. And Mr. Zapoli came over and talked with us and explained how it was run, what they were going to do, and then he stayed in touch. Okay. What, what, what is a target house? A target house is for people that have disabilities and they can't live on their own and they need assistance. So they need assistance in all their activities of daily living? They need help cooking, cleaning, yes. bathing, all of those th things? Yes. They okay. have P OT come in all the time, they have PT come in all the time, and they would park on the street, and Mr. Zapoli came to see us, 
and said he was going to move them off the street. My husband and I asked him not to because it slowed the traffic down on Sophia. Because Sophia is often used as a cut through to get to the well, hospital. To the hospital, yes. Okay. So it slowed traffic down. So is it still the case, even though Mr. Zapoli has retired, are you still in contact with the people who are running that assisted living, asking if there are any concerns or worries that you have? The new gentleman or the new person, I don't know who the new person is, has not contacted us. But it is, we've never had a problem with them. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Wright, so you can Thank go you. back. <clears throat> name, address, occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Again, my name is Shelly Young. My address is 645 Denton Drive North, and I work for Gold's Gym Eldersburg. I'm a psycho instructor, but currently out on medical leave. Um, I'm, I know that in this community, we have a lot of uh, people that work, walk their dogs. I mean, I'm one of them. Um, and I recently just spoke with our local veterinarian um, because I honestly have been under a lot of stress and concern. We had recently seen a special on TV. I know a lot of times people can you know, see stuff on TV and question it, but I had actually also printed it out that there was a dog that was you know, under 20 pounds and that had picked up in the article, it was actually just oxycodone. But you know, with everything that's going on, you have to kind of question, you know, we have small dogs that like to eat things when they are on walks, what could happen? I mean, it's a legitimate question. You know, we have, we have, we've seen stuff in this community, what could happen? Our veterinarian's literal voice was, where do you live? Her next statement was, you need to move. When you're faced with stuff like that, we already have members in our community that are moving out because of their children. Our animals are literally our children. So she's told us, you need to think about getting Narcan. I mean, this is serious for us. So, I mean, I'm testifying that, you know, for people that have children, they're leaving. For people that have animals that are like their children, this is serious. So we all, as a community, need to think about, these are literally things that we are thinking about on a daily situation. And yes, it is two beds, but we need to think about what is coming in and leaving as well. Because my husband works at night, I see random people walking up and down. It's a fear, as Katie testified. We don't know what's going on. And it's something that, it just scares me just walking my dog. Is my dog going to be blinded because they're ingesting something and I can't get them to an emergency vet quick enough? Thank you for your time. Mr. Baumgartner, any questions of her? Wait a minute, stay at the microphone. No, sir. I do. That's all right. Go, go ahead. Uh, Ms. Young, you, you heard testimony earlier today about um, an event that occurred in the neighborhood in July. Do you recall that? I actually do. Uh, can you describe for the board your recollection of that? Um, I was walking down the road um, before a physical therapy appointment because I, I said I am injured right now and out of work. Um, and the vehicle was being chased by multiple undercover vehicles because of a drug bust. Did it come near you? Yes, the vehicle almost hit me. And did you take any action to uh, notify any further authorities about what was going on? I was the one that placed the 911 call. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Baumgartner, any? No, sir. No, no stay there, Ms. Young. Um, anyone else have any questions of Ms. Young's testimony? Board members? Thank you. Mr. Parrish. Okay. Uh, Bruce Parrish, 260 Sophia Avenue. Um, I just would like to make a statement. I'm a lifelong Carroll Countyan, 
born, raised here, lived my whole life here. Um, I've seen Carroll County change a lot. I've seen a lot of our farmlands grow houses. Um, and I've also stayed abreast of what's going on in our housing market over the years. And there's a shortage of affordable housing in our county. Um, I like to think that our neighborhood Fairfield is still some of the most affordable housing, single family housing in this area. Um, we have teachers should be living here. We should have government uh, county workers living here. Um, this is a place where young families can come and, and get their own slice of, of home ownership. By allowing businesses to come in and get zoning variances to expand the, the, the capacity of our, of our homes and make it profitable for them to take residential homes off the market and turn them into business entities is not helping our housing market at all. It's not giving our young folks a chance to actually stay in the county that, that they, they grew up in or, or the people who work in this county to stay in this county. Unfortunately, we're a vulnerable neighborhood. Um, just like a lot of things, I mean, it's the, the community was founded 60 years ago. The term homeowners association didn't even exist back then. And we don't have a homeowners association. Uh, so therefore, we're dependent upon you, the zoning board, to apply the zoning laws fairly um, and not turn us into an even more attractive target by allowing these entities to come in and increase the capacity of these homes and make them more profitable. Um, do what we can to keep the residential areas residential. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Stay right there. Any, Mr. Baumgartner? No, sir. Mr. Luzariaga? No, thank you. Anyone in the audience have any questions of Mr. Parrish's testimony? Board members, thank you. Name, address, occupation. Gotcha. Oh, I have. I was. I didn't stand you when did. you started. I was here, but I didn't stand. It was free the first time, but the I, second time, <laughs> I, I brought my wallet. <laughs> Please raise your right hand. Right hand. Right. Do you swear or affirm under penalties of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, yes. Okay. Name, address, occupation, and spell for the okay. record your last name. Uh, Bob Andrews, um, 842 Franklin Avenue, um, retired school administrator, uh, Baltimore County Public Schools, 40 and a half years. Um, and A-N-D-R-E-W-S. I had to get that in. Sorry. Um, my thoughts are that um, it isn't just, I know there was a chant and I know we talk about two extra beds. The key here is that it isn't just two extra beds. It would mean a decision like this would say to the 134 homes in Fairfield that have been around for 50, 60 years, uh, always single family, residential, designed that way, um, and people purchased a home, the single most important investment any of us probably ever make on the average, and we count on that. Now, I'm the newest member to the community, um, except for the Target House, because I'm at 842, and that was a vacant lot, and that was in 97 when I downsized and came into Fairfield. That's the newest house. So I guess the point I'm making is that it isn't two extra beds. It's lowering the standards of a beautiful 50, 60-year-old single-family community and saying we can now have assisted living uh, being brought in by a profit-making group doing a wonderful and valuable job for others. But perhaps their business model was flawed in trying to think of trying to do too much in one area. And had they thought a little bit more about the people that they were going to serve that would be surrounding them and worked a little bit different, 
excuse me, differently, they would have maybe moved or transferred or maybe thought differently about this business model that, that has been created now in our community. So in my thought, we don't want the Fairfield community to be lowered even further by a variance. And we're asking the board to consider that. It isn't just two beds, two extra beds. It's the standards of the whole community and assisted living concept. Thank you. Mr. Baumgartner? No question, sir. No, Mr. thank you. Anyone from the audience have any questions of his testimony? Board members? Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Okay. I affirm the testimony I am about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Did I get that close enough? No. Uh, do, <laughs> do, you swear, do you swear or affirm under the penalties of perjury yeah. that the testimony you were about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And um, all three of you took the oath uh, at the same very time. Good. Very good. Thank you. Um, so something is not been whoa, addressed. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry. Name. I'm address, sorry, thank you. Occupation Donna is spelled Mortensen, for the record your last name. 701 Franklin Avenue, assistant to the director at a private school. And the last name is M O R T E N S E N. Okay. Thank you. Uh, something was not brought up today that was addressed and responded to in the first hearing, but I would like to revisit that for just a moment. Uh, there was a comment made about someone. Um, on a bicycle delivering a package to the house at 829 up the street from me. And there were also comments made, I believe Mr. Parrish uh, asked questions at the first hearing about incidents happening around that property as well, to which Mr. McCall stated that there are cameras on the property, but when asked, well, did you see that, what happened, Mr. McCall stated instead, well, no, there's nobody actually monitoring them. My concern is if there are cameras, but nobody's actually paying attention to what is happening in the homes, how do we know? Hindsight is 2020, but finding out about incidents after the fact is not helpful. And also, just for the record, I am not against, like uh, some other people have stated, people in recovery. I have uh, 31 years of sobriety myself, sobriety date December 3rd, 1990. So I um, do have concerns, however, in the way that these particular homes are being managed. So would anyone like to respond? Am I allowed to ask? If no, this okay. testimony at this you. point. Mr. Baumgartner? No questions. Uh, I can address the comment during my closing. No questions. Anyone have any questions of her testimony? Board members, thank you. Okay. Ann Townsley, T O W N S L E Y, 736 David Avenue. I live two houses from one of the Mulligan homes. I live six houses from another sober living home. Um, I've lived in my house for 48 years. In the last three months, we have increased security at our house, we've increased lighting at our house, and we feel nervous about living in our house. My neighbors that have young children are moving. I don't know if I can ask these questions, but who else has increased lighting? Who else has increased security? Who else is considered moving? That's what I have to say. Thank you. Wait a minute, just stay right there. Questions? Mr. No. Baumgartner. No, sir. No questions. No, thank you. Any questions for testimony? Board members? Thank you. Hello, I'm Yvonne Zeminski, Z E M I N S K I. I live at 732 David Avenue, next door to the Townsleys. And oh, wait, wait a minute, first letter, is that a D or a Z? Z is in zebra. Okay. And it's Y-V-O-N-N-E for my first name. It's not Carroll County. Um, and I am a retired banker, as I noted before. I just would like to go on the record to state that 
Um, we've lived in our home. Sorry. We've lived in our home. Hold on a sec, sorry. For 35 years, we've grown our family. I have one son, one granddaughter. I never ever thought that the county would allow these sober homes into our community. I do not begrudge their care. I do begrudge there are so many in such a concentrated area. I am against the increase of from eight beds to 10, which they cannot even fill, even though they say they have more, but they cannot even fill them. I'm concerned about the level of experience among everybody that runs these homes. You know, I'm a banker of 41 years. I have a lot of banking experience. I would never go into a home that requires so much concentration in healthcare with one year of experience or two years of experience. I'm just very concerned about this. And I would appreciate the board to consider all of our requests to not approve this um, variance of increasing from eight beds to 10. Um, the water situation is a concern as well, has not even been approved. And I think that's all I wanna say. Thank you. Mr. Baumgartner? No question, sir. Mr. No, Mr. thank you, Mr. Bell. Anyone in the audience? Board members? Very good, thank All right, you. Thanks. Anyone else want to testify? Okay, seeing no one, presentation of testimony and evidence is now closed and summations are in order. Uh, the applicant is first and then uh, Mr. Lazuriaga, you'll have the opportunity to go uh, second and Mr. Baumgartner, you will have the uh, opportunity to rebut. So with that, Mr. Baumgartner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I will be as brief as possible. I know it's been a long morning. <clears throat> as this board knows, uh, conditional use in Carroll County is part of a comprehensive zoning plan that shares the presumption that it is in the interest of the general welfare and therefore valid. Uh, so we are here on that joint request for the conditional use of the assisted living facility along with the associated variances. Uh, I'll start with the conditional use and then I'll move on to the variances. A conditional use, um, as this board knows, the, the, the appropriate standard to be used in determining whether the requested conditional use um, is will this use have an adverse effect and therefore should be denied <clears throat> If there's facts and, and circumstances in the record to show that this particular use at this particular location would have adverse effects above and beyond those inherently associated with such a use. Um, it is the general uh, zoning and land use process that the conditional use is a presumptively valid use and this board can only deny that use if there are inherent impacts that are um, above and beyond what would normally be associated with, in this case, an assisted living facility. Uh, I offer to you that, that those facts and circumstances um, and evidence has not been shown here today. If anything, I think what we have shown through witnesses, including the witnesses of uh, community members in opposition, as well as the community at large, is that the regular goings on of any residential property including an assisted living facility is what occurs now and what will occur in the future. Things like backyard parties, things like folks walking in a neighborhood, these are things that are associated with any type of assisted living facility or any type of residential use. I think what's important to note here is that we're not proposing to build anything. We're not taking a vacant lot and building a large building um, we're not increasing capacity in that way. We have a facility here that is fully licensed, fully permitted, 
um, allowed to operate as it stands right now that currently has 10 heads and 10 beds. And that's what we're asking here today, is to remain 10 heads and 10 beds. Um, federal and state law prohibits, prohibits discrimination in housing based upon recognized disorders, including substance use disorder. Um, I asked the question of Ms. Alcorn, I believe, with regard to if there will be opposition to this case, if instead of the particular population that Mulligan serves, if that population were, say, seniors with disabilities or disabled veterans. Uh, my colleague um, certainly appropriately, appropriately objected, and um, I understand the chairman uh, sustaining that objection. What I'd like to bring to your attention, however, is the use of the word fear, and that has come up from multiple witnesses, um, both from the community and um, seated here at the hearing table with regard to fear. And I would offer to you that there is no fear from seniors with disabilities. There is no fear with veterans who are disabled. That that fear comes from some other place. Uh, my question was meant to address that particular issue, uh, and that's certainly the elephant in the room here. Residential treatment depends on the residential component of care. That's the whole point of residential treatment. Um, it's the sense of community, and that's exactly what we've heard from Helen and Brian McCall. It's what we've heard from our witnesses, including Mr. Stout and Ms. Marcus, that it's the community's sense of treatment that's what gets things done. Um, the folks like Mulligan don't bring problems into the community, they solve those problems. Um, I think it's also important to note that Mulligan is just getting started. They've been in this property for a year. They're starting to build up referral sources. There were a number of questions that were asked and answered with regard to are Carroll County residents being served in this facility now? Are they planned to be served in this community? And the answer you heard from the McCalls uh, was yes, absolutely. But they need time to get started. They need time to build up those referral sources so that Carroll County residents can get more service um, in Mulligan properties. There was some testimony with regard to you know, bad activity happening within this community. Um, there was a drug bust or at least a police chase. There were other incidents uh, that occurred. Um, at least as far as what I heard here today and on August 31st, uh, not a single witness could attribute one of those incidents to this property, not one. Uh, there were no direct um, um, observations from witnesses that saw you know, nefarious things going on at this property, uh, or frankly, any other Mulligan property in this community. Um, so again, we're left to wonder, what is the opposition really about here? Is it about the assisted living aspect of this, or is it about the particular people who are residents, even for a temporary period of time, in this particular property? The conditional use standard, I think, is met here. Uh, we went through some of those uh, standards that the board is to consider uh, last hearing. Um, I'm, I'm on the first day of hearing. Uh, I would also note that we don't need expert witnesses to provide testimony with regard to the conditional use standards. For that matter, we don't need expert witnesses to provide testimony with regard to the variance standards e either. Um, these folks, uh, they work in the community, they are on site, their observations of traffic are just as valid as the testimony we've heard today, we've heard today from community members. Um, if we were be if we were to be required to prevent uh, to provide zoning experts or land use experts, um, any community that would appear in opposition to any development would be put um, at a disadvantage because they typically don't have those folks, um, and we should not be held to that higher standard either. I think the testimony we have offered meets the conditional use standards. Um, because there's no adverse impact here. There is none. There is no adverse impact. Uh, Mr. Billingsley even stated that property values may increase because of this approval. Uh, I understand that his follow-up testimony was that there might be a downturn um, given the markets, um, but that was news to me. Um, 
turning over to the variance analysis. Uh, this is um, admittedly more difficult uh, as variances are more difficult to achieve. Uh, what Mr. Lizariaga had referenced was a case, Cromwell v. Ward, in his opening on August 31st, uh, which I'm sure he will um, address during his closing statement as well. Uh, it's still good law in Maryland, but I think it can be distinguished from this case. Uh, that particular case was a Court of Special Appeals case from 1995, which amazingly was nearly 30 years ago. And that dealt with the Baltimore County Zoning Ordinance, essentially a gentleman built an accessory building in the back of his property that was too high. He didn't get any permits, he didn't pull anything. Uh, he got caught, he got busted, went before the Baltimore County Zoning Authority, um, received approval, um, and that case went up to the Court of Special Appeals. Um, but again, that case dealt with a building, a newly built building that was above the height requirement that the Baltimore County Ordinance at that time um, required. Our facts are different. We're not building a new building. We're not expanding a footprint. We're not going higher. Uh, we're not doing any of those things that would generally, um, generally create or trigger those variance requirements. The uniqueness here is, uh, occurs uh, because of the treatment of the property under Maryland state law. The property is currently authorized under Maryland 7603 as community housing or a group home. That is a state law protection uh, for folks um, in this particular community who are served by Mulligan properties. But that zoning designation does not provide a cap or an upper end number of individuals that can be served in that property. I would note that Carroll County Code also does not address how many folks can be um, in a group home under that Maryland 7603 provision. What we do have in Carroll County is a distinction between assisted living facility, uh, I think it's four to eight persons, and then nine to 16 persons, I believe. Um, so th the unique aspect that we are, uh, that, that, that this property um, kind of has is that there is a general conflict between state law and Carroll County Code. Board Member Snyder alluded to this with his line of questionings uh, of questioning to Mr. Depot earlier with regard to is there a conflict between, you know, the, the state protection, that state authorization, um, and water and sewer. We have a similar circumstance here. Uh, in that variance, we have to show that there's something unique or special about this property um, and that um, it, that there's a practical difficulty or undue um, hardship uh, that, these, that this property would suffer uh, if the variances were not granted. Um, well, the Carroll County Code doesn't give us any guidance as to that cap, state law does. So under COMAR 10.63.03.11 states that level 3.1 community housing or group homes can operate out of what are called small halfway houses which um, can inhabit four to eight residents or large halfway houses, which can inhabit nine to 16 residents. When, um, as I mentioned before, the zoning table differenti differentiates between uh, assisted living four to eight and assisted living nine to 16. What we have here is an inability to conform the state law provision protecting these properties with the Carroll County Code. And that triggers this requirement, that triggers the conditional use, that triggers the variance. Uh, I had inquired uh, of the county whether or not we could request a reasonable accommodation under, uh, um, under federal law. Uh, and it was indicated to me that the zoning board for the assisted living facility would be the, would be the appropriate path to take. Um, and, um, and that is why we are here today. Uh, to address the variance, again, the variances for setbacks, height, they all focus on the intensity of use of the property. Are you putting too much building, too much stuff on the, the land or the lot that you have? We're not building anything. We're not, increasing, we're not increasing capacity. It is 10 heads and 10 beds. That does not change. That makes the treatment of this property unique. Um, 
in the variance analysis, there's nothing to say that that unique nature uh, of the property has to be physical or topographical. Typically it does. Typically it's grading, it's slope, it's all those things that we normally encounter in a variance um, hearing. Uh, in this particular case is different in that it's the treatment under state law and the conflict with county code that create that unique environment that I think meets that unique threshold test to grant a variance. Now we turn to practical difficulty or undue hardship. It was testified that this target house, which was new information to me, was new infill development in this community. I don't know the facts of that case, um, but given the exhibit that the, the protestants had submitted with regards to the, to the tax plat, uh, I would say that that property most likely received variances um, in order to build that particular property. Um, in terms of undue hardship and practical difficulty, this property can't conform uh, to the setbacks, to lot area um, in its present state. Assisted living facilities of any size, of any variety, require 40,000 square feet of lot area. I would proffer to you that that is almost impossible to find anywhere in this community whatsoever. So even if they were treated as an assisted living facility for five individuals, they would still need a variance. Uh, that is a practical difficulty and that the applicant cannot meet that standard without the variance. I will rest at this time uh, and as the, as the chairman um, indicated, I will probably have a brief rebuttal after Mr. Lazuriaga gives his closing statement. Mr. Lazuriaga. Just a moment. Um, thank you for your time and attention uh, five, six weeks ago and today. I'm glad to see that we're uh, putting this case in your hands before 1 o'clock, before 4 o'clock, which is what I thought we were looking at today. Um, so for starters, let me uh, revisit where I started. I told the five of you and Mr. Dixon at the beginning, and I mentioned today, that despite the number of emotions that are present in this case, it's my position that this is a purely academic exercise that can be taken on by the five of you without the indulgence of having to get emotional about it because it is a black and white analysis. For everybody in this room to including the applicants, this is very personal. Luckily, this board is removed from that in discharging your duties. I agree with Mr. Baumgartner that the conditional use analysis is the easier one. But the problem that the applicants have in this case is that when it is coupled with a variance that makes it necessary to achieve the conditional use, the variance analysis comes first. You don't start with the conditional use, you start with the harder one. And he did distinguish the Cromwell versus Ward case, uh, which I cited to uh, to the board that basically stands for the proposition that it's at least a two-step analysis where you start with, is the property unique? If it's not, the analysis ends and that's the end. But if it is, you then go on to the disproportionate application of the code and does it lead to an unreasonable hardship? What Mr. Bumgardner did not mention was the second case uh, that I cited to you at the opening, which uh, is still good law. And that is the Chester Haven Beach Partnership versus Board of Appeals for Queen Anne's County case that came within a calendar year of the Cromwell versus Ward case. And that one stands for the proposition that if you need a variance to acquire a conditional use and you don't get the variance, the favored status vaporizes into thin air. It is a departure from the code which is why in a case like this, I understand that the way that Mr. Baumgartner phrased it, that his client shouldn't be tasked with the obligation of providing expert testimony to say why their property is different, I wholeheartedly disagree. They're the ones that is asking this board to depart from the code that's in place and for them to provide you with no evidence 
to suggest that this property is unique is inescapable to me. There is nothing in this record to suggest that the lot at 829 Franklin is different from any other lot in the Fairfield neighborhood. There's nobody who's even mentioned that it could be, other than Mr. Baumgartner, which is not evidence, about the application of state protection under a section of the code that doesn't apply in this case. So my suggestion to you folks is, I know you all love your jobs here. If you find that this property is unique because of chap uh, subtitle six of chapter 700 of the health general article of the annotated code, this is gonna be a famous board because you guys are either gonna be right or wrong and told that by a court in Annapolis. My point is this property is properly classified under section eight of the health general article, which does not deal specifically with group homes. It deals with substance use disorders law and group homes within that. The chapter that Mr. Baumgartner cited is developmental disabilities. It is entirely separate. It was codified separately. So what we are talking about here and the sections that he referenced in Comar regarding large and small halfway houses, I'm with him on that. That's in the section of the code that I am citing to. So it's my position, and I'm not going to go much farther into this, there is not one piece of evidence that this board can rely upon adequately to say this property is unique and we need to decide whether or not the code applies differently to it than everybody else because it's not unique. It just isn't. There is not one attribute to it. I disagree with Mr. Baumgartner that it doesn't have to be physical or that the application of this other section of the law applies, but that, that is for you to decide. But the takeaway for this is in a variance analysis, nobody on any one of these lots, anywhere in this zone, not just this neighborhood, can do what is being asked of this board by this applicant without a variant. You know what that says? They're not being treated differently. Not only is their property not unique, they're not being treated differently than anybody else. And the real problem the applicant has is that Chester Haven Beach Partnership case uh, specifically says that the failure to present any evidence that says you are unique and you qualify for a variance is fatal. In that case, the applicant was, uh, his testimony regarding why he needed a variance, and this was um, a size variance, not a use variance, just like we have here. We're asking for reductions in all setbacks, front yard, side yard, rear yard, and uh, the lot width. In the case that I've cited, that stands for the proposition that if you don't get the variance, you fail as a matter of law, the testimony was effectively, regarding the uniqueness of the property, it was unique because the property owner can't do what he wants to do. That's what you have here. It doesn't fit physically. You cannot do it. The code applies equally to everybody else in the neighborhood, the zone, and the neighbors. In that regard, with the variance failing, the conditional use for the increase of the beds necessarily fails. That's my pitch on the variance. To me, I think that is the strongest argument. I think that is the easiest for this board to latch onto academically and objectively say, you're trying to do a good thing in the community. We appreciate your service. It just does not fit here. You can't do it. Nobody can do it. I'm sorry, we cannot make an exception for you. The next response that I have is, suppose you're convinced that the variance standards for four separate variances are met. You're then tasked with the conditional use analysis, Schultz versus Pritz. Based on what's in the record, there has been no suggestion and only opinion testimony that there are no neighborhoods anywhere else in the zone, much less in our 10 zone, that have this many assisted living facilities, regardless of whether it's for mental health, whether it's for age, whether it's for addiction, whatever it is. Nobody has said there's more of these around. All you have heard are people in opposition saying, we don't know of anywhere else in the county that has this. Why is this all being heaped upon us? So to me, that puts you in a position of when you're evaluating under the conditional use, are the adverse effects associated with this use at this location 
disproportionate and above and beyond those anywhere else? How can the answer to that be anything other than yes? If you were to put one of these locations, be it eight beds, 10 beds, 16, whatever you have, in a neighborhood that has none of it, no vehicular foot traffic like this, no people coming in and out at different times of the day, no increased trash, no, you know, whatever you have, how could heaping more of that on top of what's already in existence in this neighborhood not be worse than somewhere else? The answer is it just, it just is. And then, to Mr. Baumgartner's point, it's only a conditional use if you meet the conditions, right? And that gets us to the fact that we're asking for a departure of every one of the conditions that makes this acceptable, acceptable, excuse me, regarding the lot width, side yard, front yard, and rear yard as an assisted living facility. The last point I wanna make, and I don't wanna to get too deep in the weeds on this, but it's, I think, gonna help explain to this board some of the confluence between state and county law. Even under state law, where this protection comes from, that Mr. Baumgartner has talked about. In the section that I agree with him that applies in Title VIII of the Health General Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland. He points to Comar, I point to there, they say the same things. They classify a large halfway house as having at least nine, but not more than 16 individuals, okay? Small halfway houses are uh, four to eight. The reason that is important in this case is as I told you in section 8406 of the Health General Article where they specifically deal with zoning. They say small halfway houses, eight or fewer, are deemed residential. You can't zone against them differently from a single family residential home. What 8406 says about large halfway houses is they are deemed conclusively multi-family dwellings and they are permitted in locations in zones of similar density. Why does that matter here? Because nowhere in the county's code in any residential zone with the exception of being a part of a planned unit development, are multifamily houses allowed? Nowhere. The table says that. So you can't have this use, whether it's classified as a large halfway house under state law, whether it's a different number under a different section of the state law, without considering the conditional use analysis and the necessary variances here. Do not be misled by this protection when you reach the number of nine to 10. The protection is different. It says if you're gonna have nine or more people, you need to be in a zone with similar densities where this is allowed. In our county, it is not allowed in R10 or any other residence district unless it is a part of a planned unit development. As a result, I wanna circle back to where I started. Um, I, I do find it curious that we never even heard from the property owner in this case, but I don't think there's anything to take away from that legally. I think it's different than we normally see. Uh, there are a lot of uh, feelings from the community and the applicants regarding the sincerity of this and the supervision and all that, and that is valid, and I appreciate the amount of time that's been spent on this exercise. But at, at an academic level, I don't know how this board can make a sound finding that this property is unique in relation to anything. And as a result, the variance fails. And then the dominoes tumble and the conditional use analysis fails. I ask that you specifically make a finding of fact that the property is not unique. And as a result, the variances and ultimately the conditional use are denied. Thank you. Mr. Baumgartner. Very briefly, sir. Thank you. Um, a couple of points. Um, on rebuttal. I would disagree with my colleague that the variance question comes first. Uh, the conditional use analysis and the variance analysis, they're separate analyses. They're, they're, they're um, even when they're part of the same application, 
uh, the board could certainly find the conditional use standards are met and the variance uh, is not met, and that would result in the denial of the application, but they're independent tracks, essentially, even though they're on the same pathway. Um, Second, uh, I bring the board's attention back um, again to this target house, which I did not know existed until uh, this morning. Um, again, I, being completely frank, I don't know the particulars of that property. Um, uh, my colleague had mentioned that there's nothing like what's being proposed here today within this community, and I simply don't know if that's true, especially with the knowledge that this target house exists in this community right now. Third, I would point the board's attention to the variance provision in the Carroll County Code, which provides um, uh, the second half of it, which states, owing to conditions peculiar to the property, owing to conditions peculiar to the property, not uh, structural conditions, not building height, not slope, not topography, but conditions peculiar to this property, uh, and not the results of the actions of the applicant. A literal enforcement of the chapter would result in practical difficulty or unreasonable hardship. I would offer the board that we are not simply limited to those, what I call, typical standard variance uh, issues, uh, like topography, height, you know, forest conservation, um, that are more associated with you know, um, large-scale development. Um, fourth, as far as I know, there's no density requirement for um, these types of uses in Carroll County. There's no rule that says you can't have more than two within a quarter mile radius. Um, the, the Carroll County commissioners could, could, could certainly do that. They could pass. Can I interrupt you? Sure. We're gonna go on about a five minute break. You got it. Sorry for interrupting you, Mr. Baumgartner. No go problem ahead. at all. Um, I just had two final points to make very, very quickly. Uh, the one I was making um, several moments ago was that, it, to my knowledge, Carroll County Code does not provide, um, does not have a density provision for uses like this. Uh, other jurisdictions um, and the Carroll County Commissioners um, could certainly do this, could pass a, a, um, pass a rule change or pass a regulation that would say you can't have more than this type of use within a quarter square, square mile of that use. Uh, Baltimore City does it, Montgomery County, I, I believe, might do it. Uh, we don't have that here in Carroll County. Um, so uh, my colleague's um, statement with regard to you know, the numbers of these types of facilities in this community and a lot of the testimony from the community members um, with regards to you know, that density in this community simply is not currently codified in Carroll County. Uh, so I don't believe that you can consider that density question or that impact question um, quite the way that, um, that it has been offered here today. Uh, lastly, um, my colleague had made mention of the state provisions with regard to the definition of large halfway houses. Um, and my understanding is that we're here on the conditional use for the assisted living facility uh, in lieu of an appropriate county provision to deal with this issue. And again, this goes back to my conflict issue with a conflict between state law and Carroll County Code that if there were a provision in Carroll County Code that might you know, better fit this model, we would have it. And we might be before another body, we might, it might be, be allowed by right, um, but it maintains that this use is still residential. Assisted living is residential. Assisted living four to eight is permitted by right in this district. Um, uh, and with that, uh, I believe I will close. I would request this board's approval of both the conditional use and the variances, and um, we thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you, Mr. Baumgartner. M Mr. Dixon. Yes, I, I wanted to make a statement for the, uh, for the benefit of the board, and that is uh, because of Mr. Depot's testimony and him bringing up the, what, what the city of Westminster's laws and regulations, uh, how they impact uh, this. The water allocation issue, Mr. Depot was here for the city of Westminster. Westminster, the city of Westminster have attorneys they could have had uh, attorneys here like Mr. Lazoriaga, and they could have taken a position in this case about what they, what, you know, the, the city of Westminster could have done that if, if that's not, you know, what Mr. Depot did. 
And in addition to that, in the future, if the city of Westminster thinks that any you know, homeowner in their <coughs> water jurisdiction is in violation of their rules and regulations, then the city of Westminster can enjoin those folks from doing whatever it is they're doing with water or sewer. So the city of Westminster still has remedies uh, for people that aren't doing whatever they're supposed to be doing based on their rules. Uh, council, if you have anything to add or say about that, then help us out. Either one of you? No, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I do. Just that um, while I find Mr. Depot's thoughts to have been enlightening, I don't think that there's anything that this board is required to consider. I mean, that's, as Mr. Uh, Dixon was pointing out, if there is a problem with utilities or volume, there is a separate way to do that. It may have a small impact on a conditional use analysis if you get there, but that's a city resource, not the county. So I would encourage you not to let that be a turning point of anything, either direction. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> okay. The hearing and record of this case is now closed in accordance with the Open Meetings Law, uh, Opens Meeting Act of Maryland. The board will now consider the case. Board members, Mr. Snyder. Why did I know that? I go on vacation in the very first day. Yes. <laughs> um, I was going to mention very beginning, I didn't believe the water allocation issue was something for us to even remotely consider. That's something that's outside our, our purview. and something that does not influence any thoughts I had whatsoever. Um, because again, it's not mine to judge on that. That's up for the city and someday maybe if you can figure out the city water allocation issues, uh, please let me know because I dealt, dealt with them in the past. Um, I'm not really going to dwell on my thoughts about the testimony other than I appreciate everyone taking the time. It's been a long, it's been a long hearing. Uh, I always enjoy the fact that people take the opportunity to testify and participate in the process. Um, I do agree um, with Mr. Lasiriaga Lur very clearly that, and with Mr. Bombard as well. There's two trains of thoughts. There's two that, there's two areas of, of consideration. Obviously, one is the variance, which is a, a which is a and there that we have to consider whether it will qualify for a variance or not, or the variance should be approved. And secondly, is obviously the conditional use. Two thoughts. However, the conditional use does not survive if a variance is not granted. That is just the reality of the situation. Uh, sure, we can approve the use, but not approve the variance, so you're right back where you started. Um, so in that particular area, I agree. Uh, Mr. Bundgarner said, I am trying to understand, because having listened to the testimony of the period of time, trying to hear testimony that really has identified the property as unique or peculiar relative to approving the variance. And during your closing, you said something that that maybe it shouldn't that it shouldn't be subject to this typical standard variance um, thought processes. Um, I, I didn't really grasp what that really meant, or considerations, I think is the actual word you used. I didn't really grasp what those unique considerations should be, if not <coughs> the typical standard variance considerations. Um, so, in this particular case, I can't get past the variance. Every lot in that development is a residential lot. There's nothing unique about them. I looked at the map that outlined, you know, where all the different centers, where all the different treatment centers were. And it was designed as a 140 <clears throat> lot subdivision. Every lot in there is residential. There's nothing unique about this from a, um, from a size or topography, or and certainly there's no testimony to, su to support that. So in this particular case, I can't get past the variance. I can't see where a variance would be approved, and consequently, the conditional use would fail as well. Ms. Um, 
I agree with Mr. Snyder. Um, you know, I certainly admire the program and recognize that there is an absolute need in this community for, the, for these types of facilities. Um, but I didn't hear any testimony regarding the variance. So therefore, I can't get past the variance either, or the, the need for a variance. I don't see how this property is unique relative to the rest of the homes in the community. I agree. Ms. Ford Mount. Yeah, I agree. Um, I didn't hear anything that the property was unique. I actually heard that the property, property was extremely similar to everything else in the neighborhood. And so I agree that I can't see how you can grant a variance for it. Mr. Simmons. I need to say a month in between hearings boggles my mind. And I struggle with what was said in July. And here we are, wherever we are, October. Is it October? Mm -hmm. no. <coughs> yes. Okay. Speak into the mic. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree with Mr. Snyder and my other colleagues, and I will have no difficulty voting uh, that way. Thank you. Okay. There was a lot of moving parts in this case that dates back to our previous first day of, of, of hearings. Um, there's there's not a one of us in this room that hasn't been affected by addiction issues within our families or our friends. It's absolutely needed. But what we have here is a situation where under the eight beds, they're protected by state law. Um, this was first brought to my attention by a letter from my state senator. And in that, I pointed out that it was protected under state law, that these group homes and these treatment centers were protected under state law up to eight, eight beds. And I intimated to him that I would be contacting my state senator. It was crickets for a couple of days. Uh, Justin was here earlier, but anyway. Um, it's absolutely needed. But it's the placement and the, and the number of beds um, we, we heard a lot from the residents about fear. Um, since 11 o'clock Sunday evening, fear has been on my mind because it was either my cornfield or the neighbor's cornfield that I harvest where there was a murdered body found that was dismembered. So when you talk about fear, that's real. Um, it's going to be interesting as we harvest those fields, what we might find. What I want to say is, Mr. Lazuriaga made some very good points about the variance. And we didn't hear testimony about how this variance <clears throat> would be a hardship, whether it was the configuration of the lot um, uh, the, the setbacks were, were, um, would be any different than any other lot in this subdivision. And we're talking 130 some homes. So if we don't, if we can't approve the variance, then the conditional use isn't approved. That's what it comes down to. That all the other stuff that I said means absolutely nothing, but to this board, what we're looking at is the variance and the conditional use. And if the variance isn't met, the conditional use, we can't go forward with that. Um, do they still have protection under state law? Absolutely, up to eight beds. That, that's a given. Um, that, that's, not, that's not our decision, that's state law. Um, so with that, uh, without seeing any evidence of the variance um, uh, uh, te testimony on the variance and how it was needed, uh, I, I, can't, I can't support uh, the request. Board members.
motion. I'm, I'm ready for a motion unless there's any <laughs> further discussion. In case number 6404, I move. Wait, put your microphone. I'm sorry. In case number 6404, I move that we deny the application for conditional use for an assisted living 10 bed community recover recovery center and multiple variances do i have a second to the motion a second we have a second is there any discussion on the motion seeing none all in favor aye, aye. all opposed no motion carries our oral decision will become final upon a written decision which will be issued within 30 days unless otherwise extended by this board. The board's decision may be appealed by filing a petition for judicial review with the Clerk of Circuit Court of Carroll County in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 200, Title 7 of the Maryland Rules of Procedure. The appeal must be filed within 30 days of the date of the board's written decision. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you.